Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hello to wherever everyone is. Um, it's amazing to have you all here with us. Um, as you know, we've got speakers um, from all over the world, all over Europe um, at the moment. And um, it's, um, it's a really uh, big honor to be part of this year's uh, Circular Open Studios um, with the theme of Design with Care. And as you know, this session um, is all to do with material resourcefulness um, and really how we can utilize materials and the ways in which our presenters are utilizing materials in different ways in their practices and businesses. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Christiana Tatu, um, who is in Romania, in British Council, Romania. And then she's gonna just uh, explain a little bit more about um, the program. Um, and then we're gonna have our first speaker up. Hello everyone. Hi, I'm Christiana. I'm head of arts for uh, the British Council office in Romania. Uh, what I need to say first is that this meeting will be recorded uh, for um, to be able to put it online after after the event and to be, uh, make it more accessible. Uh, and the Circular Open Studios are part of the Circular Cultures your, um, program, which is British Council, a, a part of the British Council's response to global, the global challenges that we're facing. Um, a circular cultures, cultures addresses sustainable design, aiming to promote better awareness around circular processes and practices. Uh, and it is, it is a program that is active around nine countries in Europe. Uh, in different formats, so this is just one of them. We also have a residencies and a, a conference in Greece happening in March later later this year, which we will share news about. Um, if you are connected to our newsletter or uh, on our uh, social media, uh, I am delighted to welcome everybody to this uh, second session of uh, the Circular Open Studios. We have another one on the 21st of February. Uh, do join and I'm excited to find out more about these three amazing initiatives that um, together with Zoe we have invited to be part of this uh, program. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you so much, Christiana. So um, I will um, start and uh, again, uh, just introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Raphael uh, Alvarez, uh, 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 um, who's joining us uh, today. And um, he's going to talk about his work, which actually um, I've been a fan of for quite some time. Um, and uh, he, what he does in his work is really kind of playful and exploring the kind of composition and, and shape of materials and how to manipulate not only with machinery but also with hands and that you know every single material it has a has a kind of starting point and has a, an imbued and embedded value and so this is a kind of really um a, yeah a, a, a great um opportunity for me to to invite Raf to speak and I'm very excited um that he's joining us good morning um should I share screen yeah start? that'd be great, great. um Okay, um, yeah, so morning everyone. Um, yeah, super nice to be here and I'm going to take you through um, a brief presentation um, to talk about this topic of design with care. Um, I'm an artist um, and designer who basically look at kind of material and human flows. So like all the materials 
um, often that are kind of disregarded um, through industrial processes or within urban areas. Um, and then the people which engage with them, um, make with them and yeah, interact with them daily. Um, I think for me, the most important things to remember in, in, in working in this way um, is really this connection between materials and humans. As designers, it kind of seems quite silly or obvious um, to say this, but I mean, what we're doing is essentially designing or making or telling stories using the physical world around us. Um, and it's really important for me whenever I approach a project um, to kind of really remember that it's a, this kind of two way street It's this conversation between uh, the human world and the material um, that surrounds us. So humans could be replaced with society or kind of social design um, or culture and then material on the other side. We're talking about yeah, objects, um, the environment and the kind of built world around us. Um, this project um, that I'll talk about kind of really um, kind of exemplifies um, the way that I work. Um, I work with lots of different um, clients, businesses, um, organisations to design um, anything from kind of small objects to interiors and do research um, into kind of materiality for, for other clients as well. But this project um, should kind of shine a bit of a light on the way which I work um, and the way which I approach um, materials and this idea of sustainability, not just being um, about materials, but also being about social sustainability as well. Um, again, one of the key things that I kind of take um, and always remember when I'm kind of doing these projects is looking at people, place and production, um, making sure that in all projects and all work, I'm kind of really considerate of each one of these things, the contexts that materials and people live in, um, the way things are made. And ideally, if they can all be woven in together, you kind of almost always end up with quite a beautiful, um, and like wholesome kind of outcome. So the project I'm going to talk about this morning is um, a project done in 2021, um, collaboration with um, a Black Horse Workshop, which is a kind of maker space um, in, in London um, and was funded by the Arts Council. Um, this project is called Plasterworks um, and is, yeah, basically exemplifies what I've just been speaking about. Um, the brief originally um, was to uh, go to this area, um, a, a relatively deprived area in, in London called Chingford, um, and to find one of the unused derelict shops on the high street um, and do it up and turn it into um, yeah, a kind of a public space, um, a creative space using a local waste material. So this is quite quite a difficult project. Um, it just in terms of like feasibility, like going around, understanding what materials there are that are being um, kind of wasted in the area or being underutilized and finding enough of it to scale up and kind of turn this whole um, shop, old shop into a functioning space. Um, also, the other thing to say with it is this space is, yeah, whatever material was going to be, you know, chosen for this project also would have to turn into um, a series of workshops using that material. So not, not only was the space being designed with the material, but then people would come in and um, engage with the material that had been found. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, the, my process is is kind of back to front to most designers. Um, it's really kind of material led rather than kind of uh, product led. So often when I kind of work this way, I'll go around local businesses, um, go <laughs> around the streets and basically see what there is um, being thrown out. Um, often it's pretty similar in lots of areas. There's kind of, you know, wood, um, cardboard, 
basic materials like that. But in certain areas in London, you have you know different types of of waste products. So you can have marble or you could have glass um, metals, and just kind of understanding what the local materials are and which ones could be interesting um, for this project. After kind of going through walking around the streets, talking to local businesses, speaking to people, then start starting to kind of work out what the potential um, is in the area. So anything from you can see here, like, you know, bits of wood um, to metal rebar to glass. Um, there's lots of different materials um, and there's like I said, there's things like card, which is always on the street, but the idea here was really to not take something that was already had a clear, um, you know, story around it and was actually recycled quite well already. Um, is looking for another material that was in, in, like actually caused harm or had an issue in the area, um, and so we came across plasterboard. Um, it is, yeah, it's. It's a very common material. It is basically in every single building um, behind the behind the first layer of wall. You'll have it, you know, pretty much globally, especially across Europe um, and the Western world, is used to um, as a fire retardant, so that um, it stops fires in buildings. Um, and it's just this pretty ugly um, grey material that's hidden. And when it's not hidden, you'll see it in piles um, often within, you know, tips or sometimes just thrown on the street in London. So plasterboard also um, is, a, is basically gypsum, so it's plaster, um, but there's some issues with it. So if you don't dispose of it correctly, um, it can kind of seep and become toxic. Um, so there's a few issues. Um, surrounding it just from a, a health perspective and it means that yeah there's lots of problems with people just putting it on the street so we I realized that there's yeah an abundance of this material basically just being thrown or thrown away in the local area um, and decided that this would be kind of the material of choice it's you know that there, there was opportunity in it um, as a material um, and there was an abundance of it so it's perfect for the project um, a huge part of my practice as well is um, is researching, obviously, um, and historical research and looking back at how materials have been used um, over the centuries um, really is a great way um, to kind of engage with the material in a different kind of way um, and learn um, potentially forgotten techniques and ways of engaging with things. Um, so plaster, you know, has been used for sculpture for, you know, thousands of years. <coughs> and so, yeah, a large part of the research was looking backwards to kind of look forwards with what we could do with plaster um, in this modern context. Um, so the first things to do were kind of to do small batch tests, so crushing up these huge boards by hand. Um, and working out, you know, what the possibilities of it were. Um, I'll talk a bit later about how I actually recycled it, but basically you came across this process that you could um, heat up the plasterboard and it would reset the, the, the reaction. So you could just add water to it again and it would act like normal plaster. Um, but yeah, so, so that is a kind of, underlying insight was was pretty huge as a part of the research. Um, and alongside understanding that we could recycle it fully, it also kind of took again historical um, precedent really and um, realised that, you know, going around London or most most cities, if you go into a museum or into like a, you know, a, a big fancy building, a lot of the time what we think is marble um, on the walls is actually not, it's um, it's plaster and it's this old traditional uh, way of making from about the Renaissance time, so the 17th century, um, called scaiola and it's essentially just plaster um, mixed with pigment and um, then yeah 
processed and played with um, to create these kind of marbled effects. Um, so yeah, so we had this material, we had this insight, and then from that point forward, we're kind of going full speed ahead um, and just started doing a series of tests, understanding how different pigments worked with it, um, how strong it was, um, yeah, really trying to define and understand if it was possible to do this project with this material um, and kind of what the possible outcomes would be. Um, at this point, we had a local group of um, designers that this was just towards the end of COVID. So we had in, across the UK and across London in particular, lots of young people that had just come out of um, either out of employment or just out of university, um, architects, designers, artists that didn't really have many options um, or opportunities. And so a part of this project was to take on a, a group of 10 of them um, like skill them up basically, get them to help with um, the project. Um, and so this phase after understanding how to use the material is a case of teaching them how to use it and then developing a series of uh, objects and designs with it. Um, so now we're kind of moving into the actual, you know, how we scaled up and how we made this, um, yeah, how we use plaster to kind of create this this project basically. Um, and in a lot of my work, one of the main things is also designing and making machinery that will help um, tell a story or make a part of the process more effective. So here you can see, um, instead of crushing by hand, we um, I found this old corn uh, mill from um, from a farm outside of London and then created this um, crushing machine beforehand. So we went from having this, you know, really difficult, strenuous way of like crushing material by hand to um, to this quite simple process. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about how um, the material um, is recycled and talk you through kind of yeah what we did in the space. So we had this um, industrial pizza oven <laughs> that we had to use um, and plasterboard as I was saying before is um, made of gypsum so it's like pretty much like normal plaster um, and there's a process called decalcification which essentially means um, you can remove all of the water content from the plaster um, and it will return back to its um, natural form. So all you need to do at that point is add a bit of water and, it, and then you can cast it again. So putting it in the oven for, I think it's for an hour and a half at a pretty low temperature, um, all of the moisture content would leave it and then it was ready to reprocess to turn back into a powder that we could then cast and, and, and make objects with. Um, next phase was to throw it through our, our mill process. So basically crushing it, removing um, any paper um, and then putting it into, into, our, uh, into our bespoke machine basically. Um, this corn grinder we could, I think we could make about, um, I think it was like four kilos um, in like 25 minutes um, that we managed to get down to. So you could really reprocess a lot of material at this point um, and definitely enough to start designing the whole space, but also thinking about um, designing a series of objects that the general public would be able to come and make. Um, the kind of final element of, of the project was also looking at um, how we could not only use recycled plaster, but how we could take local materials to create pigment to create this um, scyola um, effect. So um, things like local bricks um, were found. We also made our own black from charcoal. 
um, there's a whole series of you know various colors that within the kind of like red all the way through to orange and then black that we could make using local found materials um, and yeah as you can see we could get these kind of like quite beautiful kind of pinks and reds um, that were then um, you know almost turned into you know playful kind of sweet <laughs> um, like interactions basically within the store um, so here you can see some of the, the much darker um, brick color that we that we managed to generate. This was a, another machine that we made where, yeah, we basically crushed it into a fine powder. Um, and then similarly, just looking at the way in which, um, yeah, the, the actual plaster would be refined. So this was all of the waste. So we managed to create this beautiful powder from the plaster and then this was all the, the waste stuff. So you can see within this picture, there's lots of little hairs, bits of um, wood, bits of paper that, that had to be removed as part of the process. Um, but it would leave us with this yeah, beautiful powder and a beautiful pigment to, to start making with. Um, yeah, after refining these materials, we ended up with this um, basically this yeah, quite beautiful process, which was unexpected um, not only to um, to the general public when they came and saw it in the end, uh, but also kind of to me um, to have managed to go on through from something which is like so industrial grey and like unappealing to be able to create these um, yeah, quite quite elegant objects from completely from waste. So we made, so we made um, with this small team, we made tables, chairs, um, shelving units, um, everything that this store would need to exist um, and to, to withhold um, yeah, these workshops and then turn it into a public space afterwards. Um, so yeah, things like these panels were also produced. Again, it's this kind of, um, it's quite funny how, you know, this material has got so much potential, but it's hidden behind the walls and then questioning why we work like that. Why do we need to live like that? So, you know, just adding a bit of color, adding a bit of um, pattern kind of transforms this material and kind of elevates it to a point where actually you no longer want it hidden and it can become part of the kind of interior landscape. Um, yeah, and so we designed this space, as I said, and then we had through the doors. In the end, I think it was um, about 1,500 um, members of the public from the local area that came in um, and we kind of ran workshops explaining to them the, the whole process. Um, and kind of giving them this kind of basic understanding of sustainability in terms of how you can collect a local resource, remanufacture it and turn it into something um, of value basically. Um, and just by doing this, uh, hopefully with it, with the aim to kind of change people's opinion around, yeah, materials and around what they consider waste um, and try and yeah, give them also a bit of um, hands on making experience that hopefully together really kind of yeah, gave them a new experience and understanding of um, of making and of sustainability. Um, these are some of the objects. So we made these um, small bowls that are obviously decorative, <laughs> not for eating. Um, but just to show you know how you can go from something really quite um, yeah industrial and not great to kind of elegant little beautiful bowls. Um, the space then kind of continues to live on. Um, it's um, been yeah a public. Uh, it's been a public space now for, for I think um, a year and a half, and has turned this part of the the local community and the street into yeah this kind of like creative hub um and it kind of to me again just shows the way in which design and creativity can take things that everyone else considers as you know 
waste or kind of not worth paying attention to and is actually a huge asset for an area um, and elevates basically not just people's opinions but also their quality of life so you know before this before this time there wasn't really anywhere that people could come and sit and relax or yeah have kind of community meetings and now there's this um open public space for for the whole community um so yeah so we transformed this space um and kind of this was yeah as the workshops were running um it just became this huge hub basically of creativity um and it was quite a beautiful thing to witness kind of going from the very beginning of just finding waste material in, in a dumpster to to actually ha engaging with huge amounts of the public and getting them excited about making and the potential within materials so yeah so this is the project that kind of focusing on for this session um and yeah any questions feel free thank you so much uh raf it's uh really really amazing um to see your to see this project i mean i've you know you've done so many different projects and um with so many different materials and so i'm really glad you picked this one to kind of focus on and obviously um everyone else and um, please do go and see uh raf's website and look at his work further because the kind of breadth of it is is really um is really amazing um and i think um i mean our last sessions were were focused a bit on like the legacy and you mentioned it there as well having that impact and having that legacy that there is a public space for many people to use um public space that didn't exist before you know that is creative and this whole program is really focused on um kind of studio space and and that impact and maker spaces and so um what was some of the kind of feedback um that you you got in just in terms of um the usability and is there a kind of future legacy planned or you know further uh than than this one um yeah. for that space or that area that maybe you know of? I, mean, I think the the most interesting thing about working um like not all of my projects are as, as kind of integrated within communities, but one of the most interesting things about this project and, and other projects that I've worked on where it's directly with um, community is just seeing actually the the way people engage with you and they engage with a space. So at the beginning, um, people are super skeptical and they're like, what is going on here? Why are you here? What are you doing on our street? And then, you know, a week and a half later, two weeks, a month later, when you've been there, you've, I mean, the shop that we had was a complete like dive basically. And we did it up, we did up like the back of it as well. And um, actually, you know, by kind of a month in, people were like almost like forcing me to go over to their house for a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> And just like I'm so, part of the community, you come, but you like, oh, oh, he's here to stay. All oh, right, yeah. <laughs> or like you know, just bringing around other unrelated materials that they're yeah. like, what will I do with this? And yeah. I think that that was really nice to see that you know, um, you're never really sure how things take on, um, like if they catch on and if they really work for for a group of people. But actually, um, I think when you're telling a compelling story. Um, people really engage, and yes, of that space, it's now um, gone a couple of variations. It's not running workshops there, but it's a public space um, and used for community workshops. And um, I, yeah, I don't know. By council. Um, but I think kicking that space off with this, um, yeah, like engagement um, made made the whole of the community like happy for it to happen because um, often people can be a bit wary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's quite nice to see transformation of the space, but also like kind of the development of a community as well, which is quite nice. Mm. And so, um, at, just out of interest, what are the other kind of materials that they were, uh, you know, the community was asking you about 
um were, was it you know like everything or was there you know some that you saw more than others um I'm thinking plastics but you know it could be really any household I mean they it was quite varied <laughs> it's like as soon as they see that you could that you've got an idea you know of how to use something so basic as plasterboard then you know they're literally bringing around a chipped mirror or you know what literally whatever they have in the house and like, how could I do something with this or do you is it useful for you um and I think yeah there wasn't in terms of like a specific material type there wasn't like a, yeah they weren't coming around like that but the, pl the plasterboard itself was picked up from you know as soon as we started collecting material then there was local builders there was local um, right. stores that were doing refits and yeah. people even in their houses that had done some DIY and as soon as they knew there was somewhere they could bring it then they were they were bringing it to us so it kind of showed that like, if you could have these hubs maybe you know dedicated to material types it might be um, a kind of an interesting way of recycling or kind of at least like closed loop local you know systems. I was going to ask about that because I wondered how, what was the kind of you know like ratio to from businesses to to kind of household um, you know owners and I and I think that that's really important that it was engaging not just you know with um, with individuals but that businesses were getting involved businesses were thinking okay this is the waste that we've got and it reminds me of the sort of metal or scrap recycling you know kind of uh, points that we've got but we don't have these points for other materials and so there is a you know kind of <clears throat> very viable opportunity and I guess business plan as well that you could propose to um, just you know carry on and, and you know, create initiatives like this um, and, I, and I was thinking as well like this you know one of the properties that you mentioned was this kind of fire retardant property um, and I don't know if you did you manage to explore that or was it something that you tested for later on once you'd made the product uh, just out of interest was it i mean gypsum like the gypsum mix itself is yeah it's a fire retardant um so yeah so like i kind of knew that that was the material property of it already yeah. um didn't do like tests pre and post um, like what's more fire done the, the our, our chipboard or their chipboard but um yeah. but yeah I think like as I mean that's why it's used in the building industry um and yes but again I think it's just an interest like we've developed a way a system of you know building buildings that actually we're hiding we're like you know cladding materials off and adding extra materials that yeah. could be used as the actual interior rather than you know adding three more layers of material on top of it um yeah. i think it's just again this way of like you know asking the question of you know is it necessary to excessive like to you know overuse materials or is it better to use the the materials that we need and you know make them more you know beautiful or engaging yeah. and that as being kind of one of the key issues in sustainability is actually using less material so you know if we can do that then it's yeah i think that they're, they're interesting examples or ways of engaging with much larger industries that are yeah basically quite wasteful yeah and um so we're we're in your um you're in your studio uh, today um and um i can see um you know have you got any samples um or anything that are mm. <laughs> oh, you knew I was going to ask you this. <laughs> See, there you go. It it does it kind of um forgive that like yeah. I mean yeah. yeah so these are like leftover bits of. I mean uh, most of the actual material is still in in situ. And then also the other thing to say is that you know all sampling and all um yeah off cut bits they were just reheated and put then put back into production or being or then used. So it really was like apart from the energy that was taken to to heat heat them and then the extra water to reset it there wasn't um yeah any other waste really that was produced so it's quite circular as a way of working 
It's um, it's one of those things that I think is uh, sort of almost in a way the the kind of hidden costs of running a studio and running a space are you know those energy emissions, the um, the water that is used, and you know I wonder like because you spoke about scaling up and you know how that would be managed in the future. So that say that the shop space wanted to expand or um, a, you know another business were to start out on that, that would be having something that you'd have to take um into consideration um and i really love the fact that you know these opinions were from the public were changing around this waste and so i guess that also the learning about what you can do with different materials was you were having day-to-day -day, you know about you know with with people about those materials um and and i was kind of thinking about there was a point when you're you know in your presentation that made me think this is what you see when you have a whole bunch of materials all mixed up together and then you start categorizing it and i know you know that's one of the things i love to do is sort of like categorizing these things and um you know sorting out those systems and what was that what was that like in terms of um getting others to engage in that process the kind of separation and the categorizing or was it one of those things that you were like oh no i know exactly what i'm going to do i'm going to have it like a meditative uh process <laughs> i'm going to separate the waste i mean so that was kind of my task in a way was to you know find the material find process like find the actual applications of the material but yeah it's the kind of thing where you're you're kind of finding things that you think are interesting and then like either hoping or researching and working out ways that um yeah they could be utilized really and some and actually initially the you know the funders of the pro like there was a conversation about whether or not this is the right material um just in terms of it it being an unknown to some degree because you know it's it's recycled but only you know mass scale and it's just an it, even though it's ubiquitous it's everywhere no one really thinks about it at all so there's this kind of like mini like oh should we should we not kind of moment i think it it just depends what kind of person you are it's like i had a meeting last week where we were sat at this glass table and i was like you know this sand table and everyone's like, what are you on about sand? And I was like, no, but sand, you know, yeah. glass, glass is sand. Yeah. But I just think if you, like some people kind of, it, it's a way of thinking that develops over time, but just thinking about, okay, you know, what are the origins of this material? How does it get reprocessed? How has, how has it been used? How is it being used? And then what is the, um, afterlife of it as well can it you know where does it go afterwards are you doing something to this material that's so intensive that means it can't be recycled again um and asking all of these questions because they're they're really important like you know we we live with finite resources um and it's kind of trying to embed that into everything that gets designed or made because essentially yeah i think that's best practice really um yeah. And it also leads to interesting outcome because you have a bit of limitation. Yeah. And with that, was it then difficult with them? Because, you know, many people who are joining us may be thinking about getting funding or applying for funding. And so having that kind of it's then quite an open scope when you're thinking about using with, you know, using material waste. Um, and so then when you've actually defined something like you did and said, OK, actually, plasterboard is, you know, one of the top ones. How do you then go about sort of negotiating with the funders? Um, I mean, in, it was more of a kind of a collaboration between um, us and like Black Horse um, and and myself and kind of the other two. Um, so it wasn't they because we we've had like a bit of a relationship before we kind of know each other they have a bit of trust in the yeah. fact that it's not going to be a complete um yeah it's not going to be that bad yeah. but i think it, it always takes um i think regardless of what it is you you need to be aware, aware that you know it what what you're proposing is actually interesting novel and and pushes kind of the general knowledge a bit further i think especially when talking like about you know projects that use waste or like you, you know off-cut material or, or whatever it is there's a tendency to kind of 
design things that aren't so you know aesthetically engaging or aren't that thorough in their kind of um, research and I think um, unfortunately they in the end do a bit of a disservice to the rest of um, the yeah the attempt to change people's minds around the value basically because at the end this is all like an economic value conversation at some point um why do we say you know plasterboard is so much less expensive i mean it's like literally pennies versus the the paint that we put on the wall over it yeah. um and it's a reusable material it's you know really like there's a lot of potential in the material um and i had a question about um the kind of um byproducts from it because you you mentioned having to kind of take out sort of like wood and fibers and and yeah. things like that what um were you able to then reincorporate those um those those were actually sent um to an industrial facility which recycles plaster board okay. um, just because actually one of the like this the slight annoyances with with plaster is they add um yeah like little fibers mostly it's um it can be glass so it used to be glass and it even in like a long time ago it used to be um um what do you call it you know the awful stuff oh um not asbestos yeah asbestos, asbestos. okay okay mm. i wondered what the the threat yeah was. i mean that asbestos stopped being used in you know the 70s or something um so no modern plus would use that and then yeah so it, it can be a variety of little fibers and you'd really i mean in an industrial setting that'd be fine but engaging with public we had to like you know get rid of anything that could potentially be inhaled um and wasn't very good so yeah it, they're kind of like little wood fibers and that kind of stuff so all of that stuff just was sieved out and sent directly back it's uh, kind of then important to then build that uh into the system that relationship with a potential supplier that could deal with a byproduct of the of the waste that couldn't be used by you then yeah and and that's yeah another one of the big um partners that you know i, I developed a relationship with is you know one of one of the largest recycling companies in in the world um and just reaching out to them letting them know what we're doing like is it possible to go and see how they recycle stuff? Is it like, I think like it's really important to, uh, yeah, if you can, is to go and, you know, see what the industry is doing. Um, like having, yeah, background of, you know, industrial design, like the actual complexities of manufacturing. Like if you don't know some of those things, then you can either do something that's potentially dangerous or you might do something that's just, you know not that clever yeah. well i think that's it though and, and it, it kind of comes back to that sort of um researching your your um process oh uh, we've got a, a question um but also just as a good point i'll remind um everyone else just please do tap in any questions um let us you know um we can kind of um carry on ask uh, you know answering questions through the chat for a bit as well um yeah uh anna did you have a question or was it just a heads up? <laughs> Sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, but I, I think that that building of relationships, I mean, this, this, you know, the whole um, series of these sessions is designed with care, but, you know, and, and we have separated them into community and legacy and natural world, but they all really interconnect. And, um, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, as a team, we've been discussing behind. Um, and hi, Martina. She's our next speaker. She'll be joining us soon. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, I wondered. Actually, Martina, do you have a question uh, for for Raf um, at all? Sorry. Do you have a question for Raphael at all? No. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Just wanted just because I saw you pop up. Um, no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the other thing I was going to ask, um, just as uh, we're uh, having some questions come through, um, is um, the kind of finishings that you needed to do for the materials. Um, was it, could you use sort of regular, you know, like tools that were around you? Or did is that also something machine-wise that you, you know, um, developed? 
So, um, like, just to go back one sec, just this idea of like knowledge sharing, um, and I think that was like a large part of, you know, this quite a big part of the practice, but it's also a part like it was quite a huge part of this project. Mm -hmm. In that it kind of was, yeah, going from industry all the way down to super DIY and then almost open sourcing how, you know, how you could recycle and reuse this material. And then from there, it's kind of span off into a couple of like other artists um, practices and other kind of interior designers of taking it on as a potential process as well. And it's this kind of like, sometimes when you find, yeah, one of these insights or ways of working, like, and then you just go and share it and see what happens. Like for me, I wasn't interested in setting up a plaster recycling company, yeah. um, but like my job is to kind of like find something interesting and then try and show the way in which it could be used. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it's quite interesting in that sense. And then, in terms of the finishing, um, again, there's lots of different ways of processing it, but really it was um, like lightly sanded. And then um, there's a lots of different ways of um, finishing plaster, but we ended up going for this um, plant based wax. So it's, um, it's called Car Carabuna wax and it was used. Um, it's like a yeah, it's used across South America um, and it just you know it's basically really, really cheap really nice finish it gives it a little gloss and kind of can reapply whenever so you get the really nice yeah completely kind of plant-based finish so that's quite good yeah, that's really cool um no i mean that's amazing i think i've seen it before on walls but i hadn't known what it what it was but when you said it, it was sort of a, that reminded me that um that i'd kind of heard of it before yeah. um uh, we've got a question from my colleague pav um who's uh, from the british council uk pav do you want to um come on camera and and ask a question hey sorry can you hear me yes yeah, yeah we can no idea what the wi-fi might be a little bit dodgy thank you so much that was great to to hear about your process i guess what um what I was thinking about when you were talking because of material use uh, resourcefulness and I don't know whether my dad is on my mind because it's his birthday today but um you talked about communities and I guess I would say that like a lot of uh well in in my community which the background is is Indian they are I've always felt my family is very resourceful with materials actually that's what they do that's what they <laughs> You know from using plasterboard so when you say plasterboard for me it was actually quite a familiar um material that i feel like all the kind of more resourceful materials but i guess my i don't even know if it's a question but it's a discussion point is around how do you and this is a lot about what we do but entering communities with care is quite a difficult task actually um yeah. so i guess that's I can imagine you have this amazing thing, Raphael, but in my mind, I was thinking, would my dad go for this? Like, would he, I think he would ask you questions. He would go past yeah. your shop. He would be that person that's like, yeah. what are you doing? And, but he would tell you what he thinks you should do. I think that's, yeah. I think you know, that's... he would share the knowledge back. He'd yeah. be like, oh, why don't you, you know, I've done this thing with plasterboard, but it doesn't aesthetically look as, designery but it's probably very resourceful so I guess yeah back to you yeah so I think um I actually think this is a lot of the work that I do is yeah with it's a it's a strange word communities what does that even mean yeah. and even define it I've, I to me it's a bit of an annoying term because it's yeah it's not real it's just people and um, I think I mean we actually we don't call it if I really had to go down we call it family like for us a community is just called yeah. a family you know what I mean and that wouldn't exist and the family is vast within these cultures so um, but I know what uh, you mean it's a difficult yeah, word that's, because these, that's you know. kind of what I mean though in that you know when someone comes along and 
is you, either either you know it's that initial kind of talking to people in an area or you're doing something and people come across what you're doing and you have this conversation it's it's um treating people how you would treat you know your family essentially yeah. which is with it with the joke with a you know like just warmth and then something happens and i think a lot of a lot of projects and is like a lot of yeah work that i've seen or witnessed is kind of done like top down mm -hmm. and i just don't i don't think it ever works and it doesn't really feel like right in some ways and i think it for me personally like as a it, that's the kind of freedom that i have not working for an institution or not working for something like a, a lot of the people that i work with are quite skeptical of or like you know someone coming in and gentrifying an area or um you know doing something on their street that, that is unusual um and for me i'm just like well i'm just an artist or i'm you know and they're, and they're like okay fine you know there's like a you know there's it's not that you know um invasive in a way like it's it's of interest and i, I think that kind of the almost the natural communication is the thing that was, you know, super for me, beneficial for me and, you know, enriching for me and my practice, but also <coughs> hopefully allows other people to walk away with insight as well. So like you're saying with your dad, um, you know, I'm not sure what he does as a job, but there was plenty of people that came that were like, I'm a builder. What are you doing? Like this is, I, this can, is, I can honestly tell you yeah. my dad's not a builder, but he would think he can do everything, like a lot of yeah. the tasks. But like, I literally, there were people that came and they're like, no, you're doing it all wrong. And then you showed them a machine, they're like, oh no, but you should do it this way. And I think like, but I love that. And I, I like, I'm, I'm not particularly, like I'm, my job isn't to know everything. My job is to kind of like, you know, hold an idea and kind of use that idea or that approach to kind of, you know, make things come to light. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, really it's a tool for bringing people together. I think in in London, and I don't know, I, I don't know the rest of the country as well. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, we've got people from across Europe engaging with this session. I'm not sure what, you know, everyone's different contexts are, but especially from my reading of where, like London and the places that I've lived in London, community isn't really a thing for lots of people. And it's something that people yearn for. And it's the kind of thing that if you can use creativity and like these um, kind of projects, you actually do create pocket. It may be not lasting. Maybe it's like a, you know, a day, a week or whatever it is. But there is this, there are points where like, you know, people that literally live on the same street had never met each other in the space and i think that that was as much as the project was kind of looking at sustainability and material reuse it actually did stuff for people that um hadn't been done ever before in that area which i think was was quite nice as like a byproduct um it wasn't and maybe that's why it works because it wasn't meant to die it wasn't designed to do that um and it just yeah, held a space basically for for people to do what they wanted, and so. Yeah, I think that's I think that's um well actually we're we're kind of at time um but I think that's a really um an important kind of you know point to make that it is and I love the way you expressed it that you know you are there to kind of like hold an idea you're not just facilitating you know your you know your giving people the opportunity you know as well as the material the opportunity to kind of see what it can do you kind of you know also people are you know allowed that opportunity to connect to one another to connect to the material to connect to their waste to connect to their ideas and their experiences of resourcefulness and and i think that's amazing and we, we have one question so we'll we'll do that and then and then we'll um have a five minute break before we go into our um, next speaker um but they, uh, diana um says uh, what's next um and do you have any like future projects that can be shared as like a little teaser for us maybe um, <laughs> uh, i'm trying to think i mean but yeah so this was a couple of years ago um 
and yeah like the prep my practice is looking at lots of different materials um so depending on like context or um yeah specific scenarios or conversations that i feel like should be being had or i'm being asked to kind of um talk about so um it's yeah i'm working a lot with metal at the moment um and metal fabricators um but then also yeah it's quite varied i can't really that like, some of the projects i can't really talk about but i think okay. it's the interesting, the interesting thing is um I guess like developing off this project and maybe being a bit more even rigorous around the potential for for waste materials or for material full stop. Um, yeah, looking for different functions within the material from a more kind of scientific standpoint. Um, mm. And oh yeah. So yeah, it's a constantly evolving thing, but. Mm. And I was going to say, because I know you've got, um, you've been doing some teaching and some working with educational institutes um, as well, as you have been for, you know, years. Um, but yeah, that's, um, yeah, maybe that's a good sneak, <laughs> sneak point. <laughs> um, you'd be lucky if you can, um, in, you know, uh, if you can engage and you can work with um, Raf uh, in the future and uh, see, uh, you know, what he's getting up to, um, which I encourage everyone to do to, again, have a look at um, his website and his work. Um, and um, yeah, um, thank you so much, um, Raf. It's been really interesting and, you know, one project, but that has so much breadth. So um, yeah, really thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Yay. <laughs> We'll just go on to um, a short break for five minutes. Um, I'll put, um, pop the playlist on um, and uh, my colleague Anna in Spain, in Madrid, will, um, will put up our slideshow. So see you all in about five minutes. Want to be a star, yeah. I'm a Fergie. Want to be a star, but you're more like a star, yeah. You're more like a star.
Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, it's been an amazing morning so far. I, I could um, listen to uh, Raf talk about um, materials and his projects um, all morning. Um, and so um, again, like have a look at um, the projects that he's been doing. Um, and it's been, it's really exciting to um, talk about materials and talk about materials in different ways, different origins. Um, I have um, our next guest, um, Martina Bragadin, who's from uh, Spacio Meta with us um, and looking very cold because <laughs> I know <laughs> you are in the studio because <laughs> uh, she's going to give us a call. Nice Hi. to meet you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm really, really excited about um uh, showing you, um, I would guess, um, in, in, like you're not like. I know you're a creative um, in your background, but what you're doing now and what your your uh, uh, connection um, to materials now is in so many different ways. So um, I can't wait for um, uh, for your presentation and then for the studio tour. Um, Anna, um, or is it uh, Christi uh, Christiana? Are you going to share um, the presentation? Hi Zoe, uh, what, whichever Martina prefers, if you want I can share it. Martina, yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Perfect. Okay, give me just Amazing. a minute. No worries. Um, so Martina, uh, yeah, I know your background is in uh, scenography. Yeah. Exactly. So I can't wait to also ask you about that transition from scenography to what you're doing now as well. <laughs> Yes, I did. I studied scenography here in Milan at the Academy and then I moved to Paris where I started working as an assistant scenographer, uh, mainly on ad advertising campaigns yeah. and short films. So this is how basically I, I observed and understood the, the amount of waste that is created in productions of this kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, it's it's going to be, I think, for everyone, a kind of eye opening. Um, yeah, your connection to materials and uh, you know what can be done and just the way um, Spacio Meta also works. Um, uh, so it's um, I'm really looking forward um, to kind of getting in getting into depth for that. Um, just as a oh sorry, I just got message. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Can you see it? Can everyone see it? Is it good? <laughs> so hello everyone. Um, I'm explaining you uh, Spazio Meta, which is uh, a company we created with Benedetta and Margherita now three years ago. Uh, we are entering the first year of activity and uh, Spazio Meta is a company that works in circular economy. Uh, connected to the context of setups in fashion and art shows. Um, Spazio Meta is a, a concrete and tangible example of uh, a system we created to counteract the overproduction of materials and of goods for this aesthetic kind of needs such as events, fashion shows, and um, museum ex expositions. And um, so it is uh, a place, which is this very cold warehouse. <laughs> I will show you later. This is why I'm wearing my jacket. And um, in, this, in this warehouse is where we collect all of the materials we, we select. So as I was saying, Spazio Meta is a company which, of, which offers a service. Um, and at the same time, it's a shop uh, where we collect all these materials. And the aim of the project is to counteract the overproduction and to valorize the potential of existing resources. So what the service does is that it acts as a filter before waste disposal. And uh, we select, uh, we do prior selection and we rescue materials from discard and make them accessible to the creative and local community. Our uh, selection of items concern the quality and the quantity and market demands. 
and we aim to assure um, a va variety and a constant incoming and outcoming flow. This is why it is important for us to have different kinds of suppliers that comes from the art and from the fashion show so that we can ensure a constant changing uh, content of this warehouse and of different typologies of materials. Um, it was quite difficult in the beginning to, let's say, structure a company like this because um, in Italy, the, the laws that regard waste are not so uh, clear. And so it wasn't, uh, um, as we are the first project of this type in Italy, it wasn't that clear on how to uh, structure the commercial and uh, legal side, meaning that in Italy, something becomes weight waste, sorry, when the owner uh, doesn't need it anymore. This means that it's totally disconnected from uh, the state and the quality of the material itself. Meaning that, for example, after a fashion show, uh, the owner needs to leave the location. And so those materials would have been seen as waste and waste cannot be bought, sold, or transported if you are not a public recognized um, structure. <clears throat> so what was the big uh, job in the beginning was to make people understand that these materials are resources which are used a few months or a few hours in case of a fashion show, for example. Um, these materials are also very high quality type of materials and manufactured elements. So this means that we can intercept uh, very particular and precious typologies of uh, goods in our warehouse. And what we wanted to create was a, uh, a space that was uh, also a place of inspiration where every month uh, materials change and when you can find uh, particular pieces you wouldn't find in uh, construction places or other props places and um, as i was saying our selection it is important this is why communication in pre-production stages, it is very important for us. And normally we receive a list of the total elements that compose, for example, a setup in a show. And in that list, we go and select the number of goods and the typologies we think can have a market demand. So it is also challenging every time because it always changes and we have to uh, imagine uh, the typologies and the target of the public that could buy and how much they could buy of each good. And this is also a very fun side because we do not have any type of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, previous idea. Each time they contact us and they offer us different type of, uh, of goods and of creations. And as we see it, it is also a very important way to extend the life cycle of such creations and to valorize them. So as well as this is how we call the process, because when we select those materials, then we those are collected in our warehouse. And in our warehouse, we start the procedures of what we call valorization meaning we weight everything that comes into the warehouse, we divide them by typology, and we record everything on a software. Uh, these records are um, very important for us because it makes it possible to create an analysis and uh, a, da a, a data recording on all of the materials that pass by the warehouse and so we have um, an analysis of a trend of reuse of what is coming in and how much 
and which typologies of materials are going out and to which target of public. So we, this service is integrating within the manufacturing and artistic production cycle in a, as a new way to, to reduce uh, environmental impact in a very concrete way and in a context such as events, fashion shows, which there wasn't really a solution until now, especially in Milan, which has a very rich calendar of um, these typologies of uh, venues. And what we promote is so a sustainable solution and an alternative to, to this ruling cycle of production, consumption and waste disposal. As, uh, Sorry, Martina, can I interrupt? Um, Anna, just double checking on the slides and um, Martina, do you, um, um, can you see the slides? Just I see the slides, but I see them blocked on the first slide. Okay, do you want to, um, if you want to go for, for um, just let Anna know sort of like the next slides, because I don't think it's automatically uh, loading. So just let us know yeah. which slide we should be on. Um, okay. Yeah, just, you can just tell me, Martina, yeah. when you want the next slide. Yeah. Please. Okay, yeah, of course, you can go, you can go to the next slides. <clears throat> this is what I was uh, telling you before, so that we act as a filter and we try to select those materials that are not, uh, uh, there is no reason to, to look at as waste. So we, we recover those discards and those goods to be able to collect them in our warehouse and to expose them uh, for sale by kilo or by piece. So we have different typologies of materials and uh, <clears throat> this is, and, and it is something we understood why we were structuring and uh, uh, creating the project from the beginning is that people that are really not into the artistic and creative community um, are not aware that those uh, materials and such huge quantities of, uh, of these goods are just really used for uh, that only duration of an event and just right after are disposed as waste. So what is difficult is to understand and reflect before the production of an event to the latest life of those goods. And this is our main, uh, uh, this is one of our main goals. So to understand and to insert this way of thinking of uh, the afterlife of something already while designing it. We could go to the next slide. So our main purpose is to ensure that these materials we collect will be actually reinserted and reused. And uh, this is why we do select materials uh, with a, a certain system where we understand the, the, the state of use, the typologies of materials and the market demand. And then when we collect them in our warehouse, they are treated uh, during our valorization process to enhance them, to encourage their, uh, their purpose. So, uh, this changes every time, like it depends what type of goods we are selecting and uh, receiving in our warehouse. Sometimes it might be uh, after waiting the materials, they need to be cut uh, in smaller pieces to be more easily resold because as you can imagine in fashion shows and in huge events, we, we receive like re really big <laughs> pieces of everything, of flooring, ceilings, uh, moquettes. So we have to recut them in the warehouse, clean them. Uh, sometimes it depends how they were installed. So maybe it could uh, happen that we pass four days uh, uh, taking away staples uh, from uh, huge rows of uh, colored fake fur or um, and all of these are uh, specific techniques that it's better we can discuss before with the suppliers because, for example, in 
this case of the of the fake four, uh, if it was all glued to the walls and to the ceiling, it wouldn't have been possible to take it away from the support and it would have been uh, broken and we couldn't recover the, the, the totality of the rows. Uh, as we were <clears throat> aware of the, of the way of installation that they would do, uh, we, we knew that they were using staples on all of the rows, and so uh, the result is that we could receive the, the total quantity of the used materials for the fashion show. Uh, so after we took away all these staples, we could cut them, weight them, and then put them back for exposition and for sale. So these small thoughts on also technical ways and operational ways of installations are uh, really very important to ensure uh, a recovery and a high reuse rate, meaning that there is no waste created as there is uh, no um, waste created during the dismantle, which is one of the main problems. So as I was saying, selection is a very, very important part because it's the moment where we understand condition qualities and how much we are taking of the total quantity of a setup. Uh, what I was saying in the, in the beginning is that it is important for us to have different typologies of suppliers because this, this ensures really uh, a variety of products that we can offer to the local creative community in our shop. And so we built the service to be able to embrace the different uh, needs and the different priorities, uh, even in the context of art, fashion and events. As well as we started also um, path working with schools that often visit us so we can explain also this new type of job uh, to, to new generations. And as well as we uh, start uh, explaining to them the importance of why we do uh, what we do and uh, how to improve uh, the, the environmental impact effort that we put in it. And uh, <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Uh, these are the specifics that we need, for example, when a supplier contacts us and it is how our, our service works, meaning that we, we need to have specific informations because we need to understand uh, in a detailed way volumes and quantities. So when um, pre-production starts, this is the best moment where we can start uh, interact uh, with a brand, for example, or with an uh, agency production which is in charge of the event, because uh, having time in advance is what uh, makes us able to, to have bigger uh, selections and ensure that there is less waste after the event is over. So. We need to know typologies and characteristics of these reused materials, the quantities, conditions, packaging, how they, were, the, how they will be transported, for example, and uh, to have uh, details on installation techniques, as I was giving you examples before. Then the service works where we can give an invoice and a quotation for transport, or materials can be brought directly to our warehouse where we will receive them and we will start all the operations of valorization and waiting, uh, as I was saying before. We can go to next uh, slide. Uh, so diversity, it is something which is very important to us as we are trying to have the biggest community of creatives possible. <clears throat> uh, what is uh, challenging is that as each time we are offered uh, different typologies of goods 
and elements, we need to uh, understand and imagine the target and the profiling which could be interested in that. Uh, for, for the law, we do not, uh, we are not able to collect waste from third parties. Uh, so this is why what we select, it is actually what we will, what will be reinserted in the market. All of the pieces then are divided by type and we give them a price by kilo for typology of material or by pieces uh, when maybe they are composed by different type of materials. And the idea is to have uh, um, uh, fair rates because uh, what, it is, what is really important for us is that these materials are actually reinserted and that they can be accessible to the whole uh, artistic community. And as I was saying before, uh, as we happen to intercept very particular manufactured elements, uh, it is also the added value of a, of a place like this because we can intercept a very particular and very expensive also uh, produced elements that sometimes uh, you, you cannot, you are not able to produce if you don't um, ask them for at least uh, a thousand pieces. And what happens is that we intercept these monumental productions, but uh, in our space, you can buy one piece of a manufactured element, which the producer will produce only if you really order huge quantities. So this is another particularity of, let's say, our shop. We can go to the next. So these are the typologies of materials we do collect, which is uh, mainly wood, paper, uh, textile and fabrics such as moquette or uh, textiles that are used for setups in events, uh, leather and uh, fake leather, glass, metal structure, metal panels, for example, uh, such as aluminium, mm. We had minerals, we had uh, tons of um, pink sand, <laughs> which is now almost over, but we still have a little bit. Ceramic tiles, we have plexiglass uh, panels, for example. We have plastic flooring, uh, different types of PVC. Uh, we have uh, different elements uh, in foam, which can be bigger elements or uh, uh, foam sheets, for example. Um, and then construction, construction materials, such as like basic wood that comes from the construction projects and decorative elements that come, for, for example, from visual merchandising and windows displays of different brands. Because as you might know, windows displays change very currently. They, they change every, it depends, but it could be every, every month and a half. And when they change windows displays, um, meaning changing the shops of uh, whole Europe or worldwide in the same night, giving them the new, the new look with the setup of the new uh, campaign. And uh, this is how we, how we started collecting more decorative pieces that could come like as props and as uh, smaller pieces I, I could show you later in the warehouse, for example. We can go to the next. Uh, so the valorization, as I was telling you before, it is uh, really a process that changes every time and it depends from the typologies of materials we do collect. So it, after the weighting, it can be cleaning, cutting in small, smaller pieces, taking away all the installation parts, uh, such as the staples uh, or nails uh, that can be on a material to be safely exposed uh, for sale later on. Sometimes it also could be taking away uh, logos, for example because uh, it can happen that we might uh, collect materials that are uh, uh, to be anonymized. And this is an ongoing discussion and conversation we have previously with the brand 
according uh, which pieces and how they should be anonymized uh, to be uh, re reused and resold uh, with any issues. We can go to the next slide. These are the suppliers I was telling you before and uh, and also the different typologies of clients and as we are going on this is the first the third year of activity we are growing of course the the community and sometimes clients become suppliers uh, um, as well as we are starting uh, recovering and repurposing more and more quantities of materials as as the, as the warehouse grows we can go to the next. Uh, this is the software I was telling you before. So everything is weighted on scales we have and divided by type. So we are recording a very precise um, analysis on all of the materials that we did collect in the past two years and uh, which typologies and what is the type the type of target they they will be sold to so the the result is a very interesting audit uh, on a reuse which was actually missing which is both interesting for the brands and suppliers and for the clients and also it is very important for us because so we we have uh, um, an idea of uh, the the amount and volumes of intake and how it is let's say uh, redistributed into the community we can pass to the next slide so this is <coughs> where we are so this warehouse i will show you in a bit it's in milano in the bovisa neighborhood which is just on the back of the polytechnico uh, design school uh, university and uh, we we arrived in this warehouse in the end of uh, 2020 and we started our activity in january 2021 for the first six months we collected materials to have uh, an interesting and a variety of uh, intake uh, uh, in the warehouse and then in July of the same year we opened as a shop and uh, it was uh, right away very interesting the response because um, we found suppliers straight away when we opened and after six months we really had enough materials to open as a shop and uh, by the end of that year in December 2021 we managed to uh, reinsert almost 40% of what we collected in the first year. So the market, the market response was very reactive and very interesting for us and of course also reassuring. And we, we started to, 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 to put the mechanism on an ongoing way. We can go to the next slide. These are the quantities of 21, 22. So we collected 48 tons of materials and reused 22 tons. Reused means reinserted and sold to different clients. And after you see the, the division of the different typology of materials. We can go on. These are some examples of reuse. So in the left, you can see the setup of a fashion show. And on the right, there is an example of reuse from an architecture studio, which uh, used the, the fake four I was telling you before in a gallery in Austria. We can go on to the next one. Same thing, this is a setup on the left where they basically uh, covered a warehouse and industrial place from the outside with this silver technical uh, fabric that then we, we recovered and it was funny because it, the pieces of each <laughs> 
piece of fabric were really incredibly big. They were like 50 meters by 20 meters each piece. So we had to understand the shapes and uh, recut them to, to have different types of measurements uh, to be sold because also, for example, we can imagine that someone that uses for uh, that uses it for fashion design or for accessories will need smaller pieces, and a set designer will be interested, or a landscape designer will be interested in very huge pieces. So we always keep in mind the way of reselling this and the targets to have a, a better idea on how to redivide and so redistribute this typology of, um, of materials. We can pass to the next slide. This is the same thing. Those are risers that came from a showroom. And uh, in, the, in the slide, on the, in the picture on the right, you can see them in a, in a gallery uh, during an art show. So this is also an example of how the pieces we select and we collect uh, will change context. So they can come from fashion and end up to in a museum and the other way around. And this is something we, we, we foster and we endorse very much. We can go to the next slide. Uh, same on the left, it's a fashion show from uh, last year, and on the right, it's an, a reuse example from an artist duo, uh, which is Forma Fantasma, which did this setup during the Milano um, Design Week last year in a space to, to showcase this. Uh, they have an, a digital video artwork and they needed to show this um, sofas, the yellow ones. And so they used, uh, from the picture, it seems a different color, but it's, uh, it's this green moquette. We, we collected uh, like 800 square meters from the fashion show. <laughs> this is me and Margherita uh, rewhitening some risers in our courtyard. And um, uh, so this is how we tend to grow our community. So to involve schools, to involve students, uh, university, but also younger students, because it is interesting for us to um, involve also new generation and make them understand the different types of, of jobs you can invent yourself, let's say. This is the three of us from the left, Margherita, Benedetta and me. And uh, we, we all come from the scenography context, let's say. Me and Margherita, we studied together scenography at the academy and Benedetta comes more from uh, curational and uh, exhibitions and art context. So in different ways, we all uh, have been testimony and observing the quantity of uh, uh, waste and overproduction, which is characteristic of this kind of uh, uh, environments. Amazing. Thank you so much, Martina. I mean, you know, like, you know, for everyone else who's who's out there in the audience, you know, we're going to have these conversations and we get, you know, discuss the presentations and we discuss, you know, what you're going to show. Um, but then when you actually see it and you hear, you know, um, our speakers like go through their work, it's so important to get that um, understanding, you know, um, and in this one to one uh, context. And I do have so many questions, um, but I wondered if um, maybe you want to do the tour first and ah. we answer some questions as we go and people write in and maybe okay. even I'll write in questions and then um, we can also like, uh, you know, like stick around for like five minutes and answer some questions. Even. I will bring you in the colder part of the warehouse because <laughs> I was in the even office. Colder. <laughs> yes, this was the office, which is the, the only part, let's say we, we use yeah. heaters and then 
And I think it's also just like, uh, just to point out guys, is like one of the things that we wanted from this studios is that you can really see the spaces that are needed for, you know, our speakers to, to work in and that they uh, context. So this is a huge space. So carry on, uh, Martina. This is a 400 square meter space. And we have a 400 square meters also of uh, exterior courtyard, which with a grant we will be uh, modifying uh, uh, to have a better uh, shelvings and a better protection, let's say, also on the materials that we will be able to keep in the outside. Those are the scales, platform scales we use to, to weight everything, as mm -hmm. I was saying. And then we have different typologies of materials <coughs> stocked, like, for example, what can I show you? These are platforms that comes from, um, they come from Windows displays from a fashion brand. And we went and collected these at midnight when they change uh, Windows displays. So admin, so it's also not only is it like, you know, you specify and you have that conversation with the client, but it's when can you get in to go and collect it? So at midnight yeah. as well. My yeah, because this is when they change during the yeah. night, the, the yeah. windows displays. Those are different typologies of elements we have. I was telling you before, for example, them. We have, these are the smaller pieces of moquette. Mm of different colors mm. because for example those could be used on a, on a set on a photography set for example yeah, yeah. here we have uh, different typologies of uh, and colors of foam mm -hmm. and also different grades different densities yeah. you know, and that yeah. all has to be organized or that all has to be so do do um, people come and then look around when they're coming into the shop? Because I know you have kind of set times. Um, they have a... Yes, we have, we are basically open uh, three days a week mm -hmm. in the afternoon from Tuesday to Thursday, because yeah. we do need the other days to be able to go, for example, on site inspections uh, uh, during a fashion show, during the installation or during the dismantle or yeah. we do site inspections, for example, in warehouses where yeah. they have the old pieces coming from all the vents and windows displays. And sometimes they, they are not even in the region of Milan. Yeah. So we do need to have those days to, to, to play with. Uh, yeah, to be able to... Appointments, yeah. Yeah. And um, so we have a question um, from Alison. Um, you mentioned a kind of this sort of virtuous network. Um, does that, um, so does the network, like, it's a network that you have built or did it already exist in some way? And then I guess the second part of the question is, do you have any connections with other, um, you know, companies similar as yourself in other countries? So for example, the UK, France, anywhere, anywhere else that you're also connecting with, because, yeah. We, we do have uh, uh, a connection, for example, with uh, a, another association that does recover materials, uh, which is in Paris and in uh, Marseille. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we even uh, divide some materials from fashion shows and uh, Marseille, which is uh, closer happens to take part of the materials uh, we we are not able to to collect uh, or maybe we do not have market demand as an in, as in Marseille the, there is a different target of public and clients they happen to be able to recover and collect uh, some materials that we that we wouldn't sell here mm. yeah yeah and so is an and that then this so are the patterns of moquette. Oh my gosh, this is the thing because everyone is it's the scale of it is unbelievable. I, you know, so many makers, so many creatives, we have our small stock rooms, you know, and you've got this huge space to cope with. Yes, and it's also difficult because I mean, these rows, for example, they are four meters high, yeah. and uh, now we ask it to divide them to the company because uh, uh, when they were in the total quantity the weight of each roll was around uh, 200 kilos mm. 
100 cc to 100 kilos so it was impossible for us then to move them around and to even recut them mm -hmm. and um, and especially because if you need to clean them cut them you need also the space to uh, to roll out, to roll them. <laughs> and yeah. if it's four meters by 50 meters it is mm -hmm. difficult in the well, warehouse so I had, there is a, a, a question um, uh, from uh, Carolyn Edmondson um, uh, and I, I will just get to it but I, I just wondered about the because of the you're talking about the waste and you're talking about the sorry the weight um, of the waste um, it, how does it work in terms of the transport do the clients pay for the transport um, or is it, you know, what's the, the kind of deal yes. there? Because we prepare quotations uh, yeah. uh, which are linked to the typology, the transport, if a, tra if a transport, if it's needed, if not, mm -hmm. the materials could be brought here uh, from the owner. Mm -hmm. And then we prepare a quotation uh, depending on uh, type of materials and type of installation, which is the result of what type of valorization procedures we have to do yeah. later. Because yeah. I think it links to uh, Carolyn's question, because um, um, it's uh, so she's wondering how you're funded, you know, and you know, as like a as a business and how that started uh, to work. And she said, do you make enough money to survive through? just through the sales or do you rely on other funding? So, um, you know, outside funding from, let's say, Milan. In, in the beginning, we had two, we had one grant in the yeah. very beginning, um, which helped us. It was to help uh, projects that wanted to uh, get their, uh, let's say, operative place into certain northern um, neighborhoods of mm. the city and so this is when we were already looking for a place we started to focus on those different neighborhoods that needed social uh, use for uh, project yeah. and so we won a grant there and then we we won another one now in december which is gonna help us to improve uh, the the structures we have so we will be able to almost double all the shelvings and to close the exterior part of the courtyard mm. so that then, course, that initial funding is like oh, that seed funding uh, is is worth going for and how does it then it you know if they haven't heard because you mentioned that that you know so many people haven't heard of this kind of thing before and they don't know um, that you can recycle especially if they're not in the creative industry they haven't had to try and you know everyone I guess at one point as a as a student you have to find the resources to do things you maybe can't afford so you have you know your innovative hat on to try and find those and so it becomes natural if you're in the creative industry to, to do that but if you're not and you have to discuss it with someone who is potentially giving you funding what does that conversation sort of you know for us it was quite uh... Co comic let's mm. say because <laughs> i can imagine <laughs> meta is now this place is now existing from three years but we started studying the project five years ago and mm. for the first two years it was a lot of consulting on the legal side and on the uh, financial side yeah. and uh, as i was saying in the beginning people that are not really in the context of productions and a creative um, community are not aware of yeah. the quantity of overconsumption and overproduction. So basically the result was uh, these discussions with uh, people from, from the bank or yeah. from the legal side, which were basically looking at us like we were crazy because <laughs> had no idea that this could work they had no idea uh, of whom uh, was going to give us materials as a suppliers uh, and on who would buy those uh, scraps uh, yeah they imagined it to be and because you said that you you know you guys went to the um to university in milan so do you have then and you obviously have a relationship with students, you know, who are in and around um, Milan, do you ever get to see those student projects out of interest, or do they have, you know, kind of um, 
uh, I don't know, open days where you get to where students maybe invite you back and say, look, here's the here's the uh, scenography that I made. Or... Not really in a systemized way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do send us back examples of, okay. what, of what they did or uh, some. Yeah. So sometimes they, they do reconnect with us and show us what was the result of their use, for example. And because um, I one of the examples you said there was um, the purple fur, which you know the faux fur, which is is stuff incredible, you know, uh, material. It's just it's such a fun, you know, thing that everyone kind of like loves or hates, you know. But it's such an impact. Um, do you ever so, for example, the use of that uh, the architects who used it then for the flooring? Does that kind of material come back to you for a third time? You know, how, how many times have you seen materials kind of even come back to you? Or... Sometimes with some pieces, we do accept them for coming back, yeah. but we need to, it always needs to be an ongoing uh, discussion because we yeah. cannot do that with every piece, Yeah. Uh, especially if it changes its form or mm -hmm. if it adds uh, some use signs. Yeah. So, and with some other pieces that are more resistant, let's say, to transportation, etc., we yeah. we did accept a few times yeah. that they would come back, and so they would have a third and a fourth life. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how that, like, you know, you visually map that, you know, I've used it for one, and then just keep on having these loops, and it's such a it's such a, you know, again, you can do it as an individual designer with your own things, you know, transfer materials um, from one project to the next. Um, but, you know, on this scale, even building in that network and this, it makes me think that this is that virtual, virtuous network that you're connecting to, that, you know, you have maybe, maybe the architects go, okay, it's actually going to be put towards another project or it's going towards a school. Um, there are a, a few, um, I think you mentioned one before to me when we when we first chatted um, in the UK, there's one, um, is it Materialista? Um, yeah, Materialist, they do yeah. this in a, in a less physical way, so yeah. they tracked down the leftovers of fabric rolls in yeah. different warehouses, yeah. so they've put them together on, mm. a, on a web shop. Yeah and then but they don't collect them so then if you buy and purchase they will go to each different places they are yeah. located to, to take them for example yeah. so it's not they don't have a physical store of those coming which is what is different from you guys because there so there's a one in the uk that i know of uh, from um if, who connects with universities it's called workplace scrap store um it's in london um, and that is what happens is people give actually some people give donations and sometimes they buy materials depending on, you know, the, the access to it. And uh, and, you know, they kind of redistribute the materials as such. Um, but they don't also don't have an online shop. So I think that's was that's interesting. Would you ever consider to have like an online or, you know, view the materials in a way online? Very <laughs> difficult for us because. Uh, uh... May I show you like the, yeah, the height of yeah. things and the dimensions yeah, of yeah. things? So it is difficult and it is not so sustainable for us mm. to sell this. For example, is another flooring. It's aluminium from a fashion show. Mm. It is difficult to think on how to uh, transport and create a, a lot of new transport for pieces that are this big. Yeah, and I think that's um, uh, another another thing is the scale of this, is what we're talking about, the waste, it kind of, you know, you had that great slide, which a couple of great slides, which show you one, what the waste types of waste you're getting in, but also the quantities that you have been getting in that have been reused. Um, and, you know, that that whole that figure of 40 percent um, in your first year being being reused, I think it really just shows you the scale of this waste issue. Yeah. And, I, and I love that it's also coming from you know, I love, I love and hate that uh, that it's coming from uh, the fashion industry waste for, you know, short events, for one-off events. Um, I mean, and there must be things that you see year after year. So like flooring, seating, plinths you mentioned. 
Yes, for example, here we have uh, a lot of uh, black total obscurant fabrics, mm, yeah. which are in very, very big sizes. This as yeah. well, it's all like curtains, uh, seven to four meters. Yeah. And they are used in these warehouses to divide the space or to block the light, for example. Yes. Then we have, this is, for example, the, the still a few pieces left of the silver fabrics you mm -hmm. saw in the, in the examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, some other typologies uh, of fabrics. And mm -hmm. then here we have uh, examples of a um, few props. Oh wow, so it's props as well. I hadn't realized it was props exactly. like this. All fake and different ears, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and cameras, for example. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Here we have uh, black plexi ants and insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you get um, like a kind of, la you know, what's the ratio of um, so like natural materials to uh, sort of synthetic materials. So I'm thinking like woods compared to, uh, you know, uh, polyesters and, you know, it, I mean, it, it you see, was... I'm just thinking about the kind of future, like how they would be recycled in themselves, like the aluminium flooring, you know, uh, can can be, re be re recycled in itself. But there are so many things that you've got there which cannot be um, recycled and this is why it is important to try to extend their life cycle yeah. as they are in perfect uh, uh, state yes. and uh, of course there will be some other creative mind that could find a new repurpose for them yeah it's really uh, i find it so fascinating and i love also just like thank you for showing us your space because it's just thank you you get this the real sense, you know, from what you guys have built and also really kind of cool that it's a female led team, um, uh, just to say it's really, it's really it cool. <laughs> um, and, and that you're, you know, you're entrepreneurs, but you are creatives and you are balancing both. Um, and that for me, that getting involved with the newer generation, when you mentioned about that too, um, and a connection with education, educating the younger generation about what is going on. This is the way it exists. So they're not in hopefully in the future so foreign to the idea, so estranged from our material processes. It's it's really, really uh, wonderful. Yeah. It's really it cool. is. Thank you for this opportunity. I was happy to be part of this and to be able to, to share our effort yes. and our involvement in, in, in this project. That's amazing. If, if you do have any other questions um, for Martina, um, obviously you can uh, follow Spazio uh, Meta on um, Instagram and look at the website and, you know, maybe you have some connections, maybe you are wanting, you know, you're in Romania or Spain or somewhere else and you want to kind of get involved or you have a company and you can build that virtuous network more. Um, thank you so much, Martina. This is thank really you. Cool. Um, we will go on a, a short break now uh, for five minutes. Um, I will uh, put the uh, Open Studios uh, Spotify playlist um, and we'll have our last speaker of the day, uh, Luisa Calder. So um, thank you again, Martina. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. You too. Thank you. Ciao. Alone in my bed, I just wanna get it done so it don't get to my head. Icing on the cake, icing on the egg, just like he said. I just wanna go home. I've been down, I've been up. I don't care if it gets messed up. How are you? How you been? Did you get up in the thing? The sun shines half the time. What are you gonna wear tonight? I'm okay, I'm alright. I don't know if I heard you right. I just wanna go make my love and bring my love. So I just wanna go do it. Don't get to my head. I just wanna make this money. Just like you said. I just wanna go Thank you. 
Still muted. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back um, for our third speaker of the day um, of our second session. We do have one session coming up in two weeks' time on the um, 21st of February, um, and that will be um, on looking at um, community and discussing. Um, you know everything in in terms of network and, and open access to resources and knowledge um and today we're joined uh by luisa Karlfeld, uh who is from um germany she's joining us from germany and we're in her, we actually have access to her lovely studio as you can see right now it's nice to see you luisa 
Hi, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> oh, it's been um, great. I mean, and, and also speakers so far, such a range and it kind of, you know, interest around and different perspectives on you know, the scales of um, materials, material usage. And so I'm really looking forward to you sharing um, your, your work today. Um, are you, do you, are you happy to share your screen? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I can share my screen. I hope I hope my internet will be um, performing. I don't know for some reason this morning I have I've been having some troubles. So let me know if if um, I don't know you can't hear me anymore or if the connection is not so good. Yeah, uh, no, all good so far. All good um, so far. Good. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Can... Perfect. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> welcome, and I'll uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and thanks so much for this invitation. I'm super happy to um, yeah have this opportunity to um, present some of my work to you guys. So yes, uh, I'm Luisa. I'm um, German. I'm based in Berlin, but I actually did study in in the UK for for five four years, and then was also living there. Um, um, Funnily enough, I actually went to the same university as, as Raf, our first speaker. We graduated together in 2014 from Sandra St. Martins. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a little idea of what, kind of what my, how, um, where I've been in my career in terms of uh, yeah, experience and projects. And so I studied kind of traditional industrial design um, and also afterwards actually worked in industrial design for three, almost three years. Um, I just after graduating, I went to work for a design studio called Baba Oskabi. They are quite well known for kind of, yeah, beautiful industrial design, furniture, lighting. So I had a really great um, experience working there. Um, I got, I, I loved, of course, that's also why I studied design um, because I love, you know, beautiful things. And I, um, I think it's, you know, it's kind of like a hobby turned into a job and, um, um, but basically, after yeah, working then three years in furniture design, I was kind of really hungry for exploring other themes in design, you know, um, and also maybe yeah, um, um, I always loved studying, so I, I I I thought I'd go back to university, and I went to Ecal, which is a university in Switzerland, to do my masters. I was there for another two years. Um, which was a, an amazing experience for me. It really widened my horizon in terms of what design can be, what it is, uh, where where do I see myself in this whole big picture. Um, I Afterwards, I went back to Berlin. Um, after not having been here for 10 years, I, I, I made it back to my hometown uh, and I started working for a designer here called Konstantin Gritschic. He's a very well-known German Again, industrial designer. I spent another two years there working um, on, on really amazing projects. Uh, um, this was again kind of more focused on furniture, but there was a lot of also um, spatial design. We did a lot of beautiful exhibitions together. So again, it was it was another job where I got to explore many, many, many different things. Um, and um, since 2021, I started my own little studio uh, working on a ver variety of different projects. I'm going to show you uh, most of them now. Um, and um, yeah, maybe we kind of dive directly into it. This is a, a little overview of all the projects that I did while I was at ECAL. I chose to start uh, kind of showing you, um, talking about these projects. Because I think here, what before, beforehand, I was really only working with like, um, I don't know, a limited um, number of materials, whereas at Ecal, I really started to work with a lot of different things. And I, because I had this kind of um, industrial design background, one of the first projects I did was actually this, this light, which you can see here in the middle, which was incredibly technical and very industrial. And it, I still love doing it, but um, I, you know, one of the reasons why I went back to university because I wanted to, yeah, get out of my comfort zone also and do other different things. Um, and one one uh, one project that we did in second year at Ecal um, uh, was was this one it was actually a book or it was a kind of a research project where um, all of us uh, we were I think ten people only in the, in the, in the course so it was a very small um, a setup we all got given a different material a very sustainable material um, and we had the chance to kind of explore um, this material work with it in different ways um, and I got given 
this material it was a it's, it's a fiber called c cell um it's made it's kind of like it's like a viscose fiber which means that it's made from wood it's like a um, it's a synthetic process that turns wood chips into um into fibers and um, this process allows you to actually it's a very complicated process um, but it allows you to add different materials or like to, to add different substance, substances within um, the fiber. And so sea cell is actually made from, from wood, but um, it has algae in it, brown algae. Um, and it kind of gets incorporated into the fiber, meaning that all the added benefits, such as there's a certain antibacteriality to the fiber, or it's very, very skin caring, um, kind of, yeah, um, get imprinted into this fiber and it stays like that. Um, and this was my the first time I ever worked with a fiber or, you know, because fibers, you usually, you would turn a fiber into a, a yarn and then you would turn yarn into a fabric, right? Either woven or knitted. And I was, I was, I was a big rookie <laughs> when it came to this whole textile field. I've never done anything with textiles. Um, and so I think I approached this from a very, very naive angle. And the first thing that we were asked to do or that I wanted to do was um, because it's a very new material and it was um, so, so, so strange to me also, I wanted to kind of create like a material swatch book, you know, as designers, we always get, I don't know, send these material swatch books um, and can then, you know, understand what can this material do? What is it good at? What, how does it feel like? And I wanted to create this material swatch book in a very, very creative way. And so I ended up doing these um, masks. Like this was 2018, you know, on the, on the internet, you had all these influencers and all these people doing all these face masks. And I thought it was just a very interesting medium to, to, to show and to, um, to portray what this fiber is really good at. So because of the algae, it's incredibly skin caring. You know, it's like very, if you have eczema, it's very, very good if you like, let's say you would make a shirt out of this fiber, it would be incredibly soft. And so this like close contact to the skin. And hence I decided to, to, to um, make these, uh, uh, yeah, um, face masks. Um, I think I made like 10, 10 different ones in total. And each is made 100% from this fiber, but each, you know, ex each one explores also different ways of um, taking a fiber and making a fabric out of it. So you could, you know, press it, you can make, uh, yes, I end up doing my own um, um, uh, yarns using like a drop spindle. So very ancient processes, but it really allowed me to, to understand the, um, the processes that go into from fiber to fabric kind of in a way. And I, and I played with this idea of, of, of the mask. Um, it, was, it was really a fun project. <laughs> what followed from that project was that I was actually, I got really into the kind of experimentation and, um, and um, but you know, being a designer and being a very practical mind, I, from the beginning on, I was like, okay, I wanna really do something practical also with this fiber or with this fabric. And um, I wanted to apply all the, um, the properties to a specific kind of, um, you know, everyday product that we all use. And so I ended up designing a sleep, a sleeping bag um, um, the following semester, which was made uh, purely 100% from that fiber. Um, so basically what this means was that every single component of that, uh, um, I, I wanted this sleeping bag to be um, made entirely from this fiber, um, which meant that the filling was made from sea cell, uh, the, the, the lining fabric, the outer fabric, all the, you know, little trims and, and, and everything. And of course this meant that it has to be, that it had to be a sleeping bag that doesn't have any zips, no buttons, nothing. And um, this was really kind of like an experimentation into the idea of mono materiality, which is a concept that, you know, in fashion, uh, it's, it's well known. And basically, as soon as you have like a piece of like a garment made from one single material, the recycling of it becomes very, very easy. Um, and also, you know, kind of um, the, on, you know, on a sustainable level, it's, it's a lot of it's what you try to achieve. Of course, it's very, very difficult because um, I think it's like 95% of all yarns are made from polyester. So even if you 
go into a store or you buy a piece of 100, if you, if you buy a 100% cotton shirt, the, the, the seams will still be out of polyester. And um, which, which was a very, very interesting. So doing this throughout this project, I learned so much about um, the textile world and um, what is possible and what isn't and how far can you, can you take sustainability when, when, when you work with textiles. Um, which is incredibly interesting. Here's some, some, some mock-ups that I did because for this, the sleeping bag, the, the challenge was to create a construction that doesn't need any zips or buttons in order to fasten it. So what I ended up doing was this kind of like wrap around uh, construction, which meant that you can kind of snugly go into it and it would fit perfectly around your body um, without having any zips. So without having any, you know, plastic bits. And it, it was a challenge and I'm sure if I, if you know, like let's say um, a producer or, or would now or a brand would now come to me and ask, "Hey, let's let's take this sleeping bag to market." It would be very very difficult. So it stayed a little bit in this, which I think universities are really good at. It stayed a bit in this utopian conceptual space, I guess. Uh, yet another project that happened um, because of you know my because of this uh, because of because of this interest in this fiber uh, is, is the sumo diaper. This was actually my uh, diploma project, which meant that I graduated from my master's uh, degree with this project. And I, you know, I had designed the sleeping bag, but I, I, I got so into it. I got so uh, invested in this whole idea that um, here I really wanted to take it a step further. And I, um, because while I was researching what the best application would be for the fiber, for fabrics made from this textile, um, which was clear from the beginning was that it should be something that you're almost naked with because it's so soft and um, it should really always be in close contact to, 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 to skin, to naked skin. And I, um, I'm not, well, I'm still not a parent. I was not a parent <laughs> when I designed this project, but I can, kind of came across this whole world of cloth diapers. And um, I think being a designer, being again, not a parent, so a little bit naive, I was like, okay, what the heck, you know, they are the ones that are out there, the ones that you can buy. If you are a mother or a father that wants to, yeah, live a more sustainable life and, um, make more sustainable choices. I think one of the first ones you, you become a new parent, you realize how many, di how many diapers your baby goes through. Um, I think no, well, maybe you read it in the paper, but it's, it's, it's basically 5,000 in three years, which is such a huge amount. And um, so I thought, well, you know, if parents want to live a more sustainable life or make more, more sustainable choices, the first thing they would do is look for alternative diapers. And of course the market is dominated by the big two Pampers and Huggies, and they have, you know, millions of, of, of euros of funding. They have uh, huge market shares. Um, so of course, doing a, clo a cloth diaper is still a very niche thing, but so, so many parents around the world are um, making, uh, you know, are really invested and are also um, very ready for a beautiful alternative here. So doing this research into cloth diapering, uh, which was very, very funny. I, I learned so much. I realized that I really want to design a diaper. I don't think anyone has ever designed a beautiful diaper. I don't think anyone has ever spent more than five minutes thinking about it. And also what the materials are that go into a diaper. So a disposable, disposable diaper is, I think, 80 to almost 90% plastic. The rest are um, like, is like, um, high, highly absorbent cellulose and also these super polymers. Not sure where that noise is coming. Is it me? No. <laughs> no, I have no idea. Oh, it's good. Well, I just continue. I, I thought I thought for a second. That, um, yeah, so diapers. So yeah, basically I then spent uh, a whole semester um, uh, first of all, I started with the fabric. So basically what I was just saying that um, disposable diapers are made out of plastic and cloth diapers currently are also made a lot out of plastic. So the, the fabrics that you use or that are currently being used to make cloth diapers are, you know, polyester, uh, laminated um, nylon fabrics. Usually the absorption core is made from a cotton fiber or uh, from bamboo. 
Um, but what, what, what became, you know, what was apparent to me very early on that no one has ever designed or like no one has ever created or engineered a fabric that is that that is specifically um, used for this context. So something that's incredibly soft, something that has to be you know um, very powerful in, in in its absorption capacity. And so I uh, designed or I engineered the first kind of prototype fabric from the sea cell fiber, uh, which I did with together with the textile institute in in Germany, and I. Um, created these these prototypes that you saw here where the ones i designed in 2019 were 100 made from this um from the sea cell fabric that i created um of course designing something for you know the babies meant you have to um to go through a lot of testing so here I, um, you know, thankfully there were some some girls at my university who already were parents, who, who were mothers. So I got them to come in, bring their babies, and I made all these prototypes on my own sewing machine of, you know, the fit, the sizing. It was actually what started out as, ah, oh, I'm just going to do the diaper very quickly, became this huge scientific um, research project also, you know. Um, because of course you can't really just buy a pampers and then copy the, the pattern of it because a cloth diaper has to sit differently. Cloth diapers tend to, for example, don't fit newborn babies so well because, you know, they hardly have like, you know, they're very small and um, just by the construction of it, it's actually, the fit becomes better the, the more flesh, so to say, there is. Um, um, so that was really, really interesting. Um, this project has followed me until now. I basically um, won a bunch of design awards with this, and um, it was, you know, it was it was it was great fun. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and then maybe I go back to this slide. Um, basically, this kind of picture a little bit went around the world because, of course, you know. So many parents all of a sudden wrote me, hey, oh my God, I want to buy your diaper. This is so beautiful. I've never seen something like this. And also, you know, I think as, a, what, as I was doing it, I didn't realize it, but, you know, I took a, a, an everyday quite utilitarian product and kind of elevated it through the use of a certain, through the use of materials. And I think I really hit a little nerve there, especially when it came to, you know, parents who were already using cloth diapers and um, they kind of felt heard. I think this is what what I sometimes feel like. I think um, I, I love working. I'm still, not, as I said, I still don't have, have, even have a baby myself. But I think you know, as designers, we are we learn to be very empathetic, and we learn very early on to design products that are not be, even even been used by ourselves. Um, so I, as I said, I got um, amazing feedback from parents, um, also from parents that were that were using disposable diapers and were like, okay, I mean, I would use your diaper tomorrow if it was on the market. And even people wrote me and said, okay, I don't, I don't have babies yet. I want to, you know, have a baby just to put you in one of your beautiful diapers. So, of course, that was a huge motivation to make something more out of it. And um, so I um, have spent the last three years um, together with my have a, to, with my business partner Kaspar that I now run Sumo with. To um, what started with the diaper has now become really a fully fledged company that uh, we had a soft launch in, in 2022 last year, and um, we have now managed to you know set up the whole supply chain. So um, three we are. Custom we have we have custom developed um, three fabrics ourselves in Portugal with a mill there, and we are uh, working with suppliers in Germany and in, in 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 Spain. And what started as you know kind of like one product a diaper, um, quickly we realized through you know testing this diaper through doing extensive user research that what would really that works the best when it, when you start with cloth diapering is to kind of have a system to make it very hassle free because of course you know a cloth diaper you can't just chuck away in the next bin uh, when you're on the you know when you're out and about and also um, there are certain things that you need to kind of yeah do a bit differently when you do cloth diapering so we ended up designing this whole system we are right now um, 
uh, you can you can buy these four products, which is the, the original Sumo diaper, which um, is now kind of more like a two part system. So you have the outer waterproof diaper and then you have these uh, highly absorbent uh, UFOs, the inlays that you place into the diaper. We developed this. Um, it's kind of like it's like a, it's a di it's called a diaper liner. It's, it ba basically catches the baby's big business and makes it easier to kind of dispose of that or flush it before you know then putting the the inlay and the outer diaper into into the washing machine. And then we also designed a bag, um, which means that you know this is kind of like a it's called a, a wet and dry bag. You can store your fresh diapers, but it also has this waterproof compartment where you can store your used uh, um, diapers and inlays. And uh, when you get home, you just have to open that bag and put that into the washing machine. So you don't even need to handle, you know, dirty, mucky things. So I think this is, we, we launched with this in 2022. We're going to uh, relaunch our store at the end of the month because, you know, already during this half a year and kind of, you know, the diapers out there, people are using it. Um, it meant huge amounts of feedback. And, you know, as I said a little bit at the beginning, um, the big disposable, our big disposable competitors have had, you know, um, 50 years of, of, of lots of money and lots of funding and research to create a very, very well working disposable diaper. And I think what we really want to do with Sumo is kind of take some of or more, a lot of their market share by really trying to re engineer what is a good diaper, you know. And I think a lot of parents are understanding um, that. Um, or are very open to um, really rethinking this. Also, you know, I think sometimes what we what we use what we used to say what we you what we what you're usually saying is that you know this diaper is not really a high like it is still a like a, um, a product that sits in the hygiene space, but it's also more of a piece like a piece of clothing. And I think this is kind of like a contextual thing that maybe you know maybe in 10 years we will all look back and be like wow okay wow there were these people who put their babies in these plastic bags whereas you know now everyone is using beautiful reusable products that are made from really highly engineered materials that um are, are just also performing better than the disposable alternatives um so with sumo you know it was not only doing all the um the, the, the material research, it was also, you know, kind of building a company, building a brand. Um, how, how should this diaper company feel like? What do people, how do you speak to modern parents? I think this is what, what went also a lot of into the packaging. And um, um, yes. Um, so yeah, if you have any more questions, I'm going to stop talking about this project because I feel like this is 80% of my time I'm doing this and it's fun and it's great. But um, I, I do reserve 20% of my time to do other things, uh, or at least, you know, I try to. Um, and when um, this topic of, you know, like resourcefulness and kind of uh, materials um, came up, I kind of went through, yeah, other pro projects that I did in the past um, that I thought were maybe a little bit fitting to this. So I'm just going to show you two more projects. Um, this one was an exhibition I was invited to uh, last year. It was at Madrid Design Week in January last year. Um, and it was quite interesting. I've never you know, done anything like this. It was basically, this was an exhibition that was being held at the uh, Decorative Arts Museum in Madrid, which is a beautiful, I mean, it's a beautiful space. Um, and you know, like, like all uh, decorative arts museums, you know, there are pieces which are incredibly beautiful. It's all about decoration and embellishment. It does feel a bit dusty, like <laughs> kind of like past century. And um, the curators of this exhibition asked, I think it was five of us or six of us, to kind of rethink the role of the, of the museum and what museums um, can be nowadays. Um, because what decorative arts museums used to be is that you know they had this kind of it was kind of like an educational institution also people would go there and see uh, objects of everyday use that were uh, highly decorative and it was kind of also this institution to um how do you say to educate your taste kind of and i thought this was really really interesting uh, this um, idea of a museum um, uh, educating your taste 
And um, as I don't live in Madrid, um, but I had to, you know, create a piece that 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 would fit into this exhibition. I um, spent a lot of time on the the online archive of this museum and uh, looking at their pieces. And this is kind of, you know, like this is what they they have there: um, beautiful objects, amazing materials, you know, glass, ceramics, metals, just super beautiful. And um, what kind of started to form in my head it was this idea that I would love for people or for people who visit this exhibition or visit uh, the, the museum um, that they could take something home with them out of the museum and um, what I ended up doing was that I would um, in a very very abstract way look at these shapes and these patterns and the colors that I you know saw on the online on this two-dimensional online uh, online archive and um, abstract them so I made these very abstract shapes um, um, out of a, a certain material that is called a 180 degrees decal. I don't know if you guys know this. I, when I was in kindergarten 10 years earlier, 20 years ago, this was a material, basically it comes in like A4 sheets and you can cut shapes out of it. And if you would um, uh, put it into water, it becomes um, uh, wet. You can then apply it to almost any kind of surface, usually glass or ceramics. Um, and then you can fire it in your oven at 180 degrees. And um, so when I, what I did here was that I um, created these packs of stickers. You know, they were two-dimensional, didn't cost a lot of money. Um, and I kind of cut out these shapes, which were inspired by the, 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 the um, uh, you know, the vessels and the objects I saw there. And uh, so people could buy one of these, you know, sticker, sticker packets for two or three euros, not a lot of money, and could basically go home and embellish other things with it. Um, and this was kind of this idea of like, and I, I picked this project because I thought it was, you know, I, I felt quite resourceful, you know what I mean? I really wanted to make a big impact with something quite small and something that didn't cost, cost a lot of money. It didn't involve, you know, a lot of things. It was just, you know, something I could do at home, but it meant that, so these vases that you can see here, these are examples of what you could do with these stickers. You know, you just take a, um, a very basic, simple vessel and you can um, embellish it. You can take a piece of the museum home with you um, and, and create something new. It was very beautiful. This is this picture on the right here. This is from a, a room in the Decorative Arts Museum. Um, and it was just, the contrast was just amazing. So, the, you know, you had this, um, these century old vessels with these beautiful, uh, ornaments and then you had this uh, <laughs> 2022 abstraction of what I what I did. Um, I thought that was very beautiful. Um, yeah, another project that I wanted to show you, um, which has an, you know is, is very far from from what I do on my every from my day to day with Sumo, is a project I started last year with my um, sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, she, she's from El Salvador, which is a small country in South America. It's, uh, it sits between Guatemala and Honduras. It's very, very small. Um, and uh, um, we traveled there together last year and I became obsessed with a certain craft that um, they do. I think it's a craft that, you know, uh, um, that people do across South America. I know this also, they, they do this also in Guatemala. It's, um, it's, it's weaving baskets, it's basketry. Here are some, some pictures I took there. And um, I just became obsessed. You know, I think I already, as you maybe can see from my work, I, I, do, I, I love patterns and I love color. And I think um, having had this background in like heavy industrial design, this was always kind of like a refuge for me um, to, to um, feel almost a little bit more like an artist in my practice. And um, so I traveled there with my with my sister-in-law and we met all these, um, um, I mean, they, they sell these baskets on the streets. Usually the, the people are very poor there. And the basketry is actually something that the government, um, it's an initiative from the government um, that they teach people, um, usually women and this craft so that they can, you know, you can buy these uh, plastic strips for quite cheap or you don't even have to use, you can use any material that you also found. I saw people doing it with telephone cords recycled and basically um, with, without a lot of material and um, they, they give people the skills to create something that has a lot of value. 
So these baskets there, people buy them, they go on the market with them, you can store your home goods there. And I thought it was just, it was, it, I found it so astonishing um, that people have very little, you know, compared to how we live here in Europe and there. And, you, you know, from, from, from nothing, they make these beautiful um, quality, the quality is so, so good. And I took a bunch of baskets home with me. But what we also did is that we uh, found the supplier or we, we researched, we were in San Salvador driving around uh, crazy traffic uh, with my sister-in-law and we found the, a supplier of, of these, uh, it's called, it's, it's made from high density polyethylene, which is um, one of the world's most widely recycled um, uh, polymers. It's basically, you know, like a, uh, Persil bottles, all these kind of like detergent bottles. That's high density polyethylene. Um, so it's after PET, one of the most recycled plastics out there. And that's the plastic that they use. So you can find it both in virgin quality, but also strips of recycled um, HDPE. Uh, so we found a supplier there that we now work with. We are developing um, recycled versions of this plastic now. Um, and we found um, a, a family, a woman, a craftsperson that is um, uh, kind of doing, or like she's our artisan now, and we are we are um, giving her our, our designs and working closely with her making baskets. Um, this first picture I showed you here are some of the baskets that we made with her there. Um, and so basically, I now run a little collective, it's called Rayas, together with my sister-in-law, where we make very small runs of these baskets in three different sizes. And uh, we uh, take them to Europe and we are selling them here. Um, I, the, the online shop is not <laughs> um, uh, uh, online yet. We, I'm still tweaking and working on it, but basically this is kind of like a little overview of um, what, uh, what, is, what is in store. And um, as I said, yeah, it's, I think it's kind of like, on the one hand, it's kind of like a social project where we are going to start working with more and more artisans over there. Um, but also, I think it gives me a little bit, um, it's, it, it's really the creative person that I am. I can, you know, I can run a business and I also love doing that. But this kind of gives me almost like a little artistic vehicle to express other needs that I have, you know, may they be color or materials and um yeah, so I think we're at the end of the presentation. Um, feel free to, you know, contact me, check out the different uh, 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 brands. Um, and yeah, let me know. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, amazing to kind of like, I guess, see your process. And one of the things, um, you know, I think I've mentioned um, to you in our first meeting was that actually we, you know, the way you kind of showcase things and the way you show kind of the overlapping of your projects from the beginning or your, you know, your experiences, your career from the beginning, because it's, and I think it actually would be such a useful exercise for everyone to do to see how many projects that they are overlapping or how many changes that they have made in their, in their lives. And, um, it, it just it's just wonderful to see that and then you know kind of go in in mm. depth um i really um i mean i i you know your work caught my eye um i think because it does have such a beautiful balance between materials and um how they how you can use them and how um, they can then impact you know and and who you connect to others so it kind of a really kind of uh, uh, kind of stretches and, and and pulls those um pulls at those links um one of the things that I guess I didn't really um know is that as when I had seen your sleeping bag project is that that was also made from sea cell um and so how did it then feel to kind of uh go from you know you were prototyping small masks and then scaling that up and then the the kind of increase of that material usage and then maybe also to be resourceful um, mm. in that sense about what you were using. I mean, not having any fastenings in a, in a sleeping bag is, is a whole challenge in itself, let alone using just one material. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this, um, I, I, I can go into more detail with this project. The, the thing with the sleep bag, sleeping bag was that after having done, you know, the masks and kind of, you know, falling in love with a certain material, I was okay, let's do, a, let's do a, an actual product out of it. And then as I was researching, I realized, oh, no one, no one has ever actually, I mean, you can find fabrics that have like 5% sea cell in it. Um, 
but it's usually just like an added kind of, you know, an added little fiber. So I actually struggled finding a material um, that, you, that, that was made out of sea cell. Yeah. So this sleeping bag, I actually made from substitute fabrics. I kind of pretend, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, let's pretend I had access to this material. How would I, you know, what would I then do with it? So I ended up using, I mean, I still ended up using very interesting materials. They were still, com it was still completely um, polymer or plastic free, um, which was another great exercise to kind of, you know, get into this kind of like researching and finding materials. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was definitely a big challenge for me making these small mock-ups. And I mean, on a sewing machine, you know, you can like make small things, but then all of a sudden you are dealing with like two meter long fabrics. Yeah, yeah. That definitely was um, a big challenge. And then afterwards, when I back, went back to the diaper, then I was like, oh, this is a better scale again for me. Yeah. And did you, yeah. keep, um, did you keep uh, sort of scraps as well to use? I'm just thinking even just of your process, just, yeah. you know, kind of storing those so that you can use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think looking back, you know, I think it was definitely like, it, you know, it took me like, Two, two years to really also wrap my head around working with textiles as a designer. So what I did at the beginning was, you know, I don't know if you, if you work with wood or metals, you know, it's kind of like the, the thing comes at, 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 on a certain size already, but you never, you never think about, for example, like widths of materials, whereas with mm. textiles, of course, you know, like, you know, you always have like usable widths and you, and what I, then started doing with, with Sumo after the first prototypes was really to also look at, okay, how actually, how wide does this material come in and how, how can I design, for example, the, the schlep bag, which was this, this I completely redesigned um, in order to fit better on my fabric, which yeah. was something that I never did before. You know, there I was like, okay, actually making this 40 centimeter instead of 42, what makes much, much, much more sense. And I think there also resourcefulness, working with materials um, is such a learning process. You have to <clears throat> understand the, the architecture behind it more. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's really important to kind of think about, you know, uh, with, with Raphael, he's to almost talking, you know, when he was talking, he was talking about a kind of um, an unimaginable amount of waste and the kind of yeah. scale of it. Yes, you could kind of maybe from from the supplier see the size of the passerboard panels you know with uh, Spazio Meta uh, with uh, Martina there's just so many things you know you'd have to address first but you're really also talking on this smaller scale and I will say with a textile it can be very different um, having mm -hmm. those dimensions and working within those parameters and uh, it's actually that we'll have a speaker in session three who I think actually we'll have two speakers in session three who I think you would really love and to connect to and, and talk about that um, with and working within those kind of material mm -hmm. dimension parameters um, and monomateriality is such a nice phrase um, also. Um, I can see we've got a question from um, uh, Pav, um, uh, who's our colleague in um, in the UK, in British Council. Um, if you want to um, pop on your camera, Pav, um, and just ask your question. Thank you so much. That was so interesting, Louisa, and hey, everyone. Um, I guess in all the <laughs> the conversations, I, I'm the perspective I'm I'm looking for from. Um, which um, kind of informs a lot of the programs and how um, I would go about them or design is like from, you know, different access points for people and how um, communities are involved. I know we, we had a question mark around that um, wording in, in Raphael's, but, um, mm. and also how different diverse communities feel represented within, within design. So starting from that point, just to say why I'm asking this question and why, <laughs> again, it's a difficult one. Um, but look, again, the diaper mm. is like you said, it's a and I love your work and I think there's a lot of care in it. And I really think it fits our theme around the Secular Open Studios. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I love your process and how detailed you are. I know there's a lot of care in it. So this comes from from that perspective of mm -hmm. access and it is that diapers are everyday objects and as soon as we start designing actually with care and sustainability in mind for a lot of communities the product becomes exclusive mm -hmm. it becomes expensive mm -hmm. um, and it's not accessible and it's hard mm -hmm. to change their 
traditions actually around objects which have mm. been used as disposable objects and mm. so really it's around the provocation of yeah how do you mm. how do communities access that because I again I bring my family into it mm. but I can't imagine even if it's a huge behavioral shift for someone to spend some pounds on on buying diapers to like I don't know the exact price point, but I tried to research it a bit mm. through the Kickstarter or other things. And, it, you yeah. know, it could be it can range from, you know, 40 to 600 mm. euros mm. for this. Because that's another context of this, right? So how do you negotiate that as a designer for you? And it doesn't have to be for that market, but I'm saying mm -hmm. I think it does exclude markets if yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, it's a really, really important topic. And I, 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 I spend a lot of time thinking about like impact, you know, and also like impact at scale, you know, just because yeah. certain wealthy um, communities can, can, you know, afford kind of like a well-designed, let's call it like luxury diaper, exclude so many, and then you have no impact. Um, and yes, totally agree. So basically, you know, like one disposable diaper, even the luxury ones are like 20 cents or something, right? Our diaper one is 39 and you, you know, one diaper, you can't do anything with it. You need to buy a set and as you just said exactly. So like our most expensive set, uh, which is a full-time kid is around like 660 euros. Of course, that means you have enough diapers to diaper one child for three years and po potentially also um, siblings. But of course, you know, most people don't you know it's really like you need a very big pre-investment to be to able to be able to afford that so what what um we are have started trialing and i think that could, this is the only this is a solution to it is um you could potentially have it like a subscription service you know so there are ways to kind of offer it you know at a much 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 lower price to um to people who cannot afford such a big you know pre initial investment. So I think in terms of business model for our business, we are looking into many ways of making this affordable to um, a bigger amount of people, because that's what we want. We, you know, we want everyone to be able to afford something like this. Um, so think, yes. No, no, that's really brilliant. And it's so good that you could break it down into per diaper because it makes more sense for people. So to shift from 20 to 39. Okay. It is kind of double, but yeah. It, still gives a context of mm. a diaper. I guess for me, mm. it's really interesting and it's a whole other mm. uh, conversation, but one is that as an act of response, so price is one. And then another cu cultural part, So, and again, to give you context is that when we're working on this program, it's it's in Europe, another region I, I um, kind of oversee is South Asia. And yeah. there, for example, so again, it's a cultural framework. Mm. So I would say that hygiene comes up, behavioral psychology around hygiene, the idea that you could use the same diaper mm. again and again for a lot of cultures yeah. is not something that is an easily changeable behavior, you know, to get them mm. into thinking um that we will reuse the diaper as sustainable mm. as it might be so it's really interesting just there are a couple of touch points to think mm. about in the future that are like actually even though that's amazing and it looks at the material and sustainability yeah. some people might still i mean no product fits all you know what i mean and that's the thing and i yeah. think but yeah. it's just almost good to Mm. Um, mm. always have a maybe a pinch point to be like yeah, oh, yeah, interesting because yeah. you could design it out but I can imagine yeah I think there it's a lot about like how you communicate it like you know what what images or wording or what I, you know what I find it, it's interesting because you know at the end of the day the first Pampers was like invented in the 1950s or something so we had 60 60 70 years of disposable diapers and it wiped out everything else you know i find it so interesting like sometimes people come to me like oh yeah i like you know anyone up 50 or 60 upwards i like i am i was diapered in cloth and it's it's so interesting the difference um like i find it very interesting how hy hygiene is an important topic but for a lot of people it's unhygienic whereas 
I just find this cut is how many no no you're totally right and I do feel like this is around capitalist um narratives as well because for yeah. example the plastic bag wasn't used in a lot of the global yeah. south and it was introduced as something mm. and then it became their norm and now it's hard to get it out you yes. know so the minute yeah. you you kind of push another material or thread mm. into the culture a cultural thread mm. quite literally like plastic yeah. um you know when they would have used cotton and they wouldn't have used synthetics in their yeah. materials but now yeah. synthetics help them weave better because yeah. for example if you look at weaving culture and you looked at the basket weaving and mm. now they don't want to necessarily take plastics mm. out so yeah. we, we might have started with mm. diapers of cloth mm. but we've ended in a structure that mm. you know is looping back on itself but anyway like it's just uh <laughs> I, it's just I, an honest conversation around these yeah, yeah. themes, you know. And I think plastic, you know, plastic is a material, it's so polarizing. Like I would say I I love plastic. <laughs> it's like it's something very, you know, like polarizing to say. But you know, for example, in the diaper, we try to do a 100 plastic free version and we failed. And I think, you know, maybe in five, six, seven, ten years, we will be able to, but you know, there are certain things that a synthetic fiber is so incredibly good at, like, you know, waterproofing, durability, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, having something that's waterproof and uh, um, breathable, you mm -hmm. can't do with a, with a natural fiber currently. And also, mm -hmm. I think this is why I think some of people are like, oh, why are you doing these plastic baskets? But, you know, exactly for, for the people from El Salvador, this material was like life changing, you know, it's, and I, I find it very, very interesting. And, and I am not one to, I, I don't quickly judge if, if plastics because I think, and I think it's, it's, it's the disposability of plastic that I have a problem mm -hmm. with. Yeah. But if you have a diaper that can, you know, like any other piece of clothing, you know, you use it and has, I don't know, 5% PL layer laminate on it. I think that's a different conversation to have. Yeah. We've had um, uh, just a comment from uh, Mark, just as you stopped there uh, saying, isn't it a question of marketing and education as with plastic bottles, et cetera, irrespective of, of culture or class? I mean, yeah, I, I think that's true. You're going to have everywhere. We know that plastics, microplastics are everywhere in the world. Yeah. So we know that it's reaching. Uh, yeah. whether they have plastic there or not in their, you know, in their economy. Because yeah. um, yeah. there are some places, you know, that are, are, are you know, it hasn't reached yet. Yeah. Not many, but there will be. Um, and so I think it is, uh, you know, about our, our habits as well and, and how it's integrated in our culture, but, um, mm. uh, and various different cultures and how, you know, we, we kind of educate the younger generation, which I think mm -hmm. is even something that Martina mentioned on the previous, you know, to, um, uh, you know previous speaker. Um, but so, so, and because also the, it's interesting because obviously you, you've mentioned that you get so much feedback from, you know, having even just put it out there. And so all of these comments are constantly like, you know, must be constantly yeah. coming in. So how do you kind of, um, are you categorizing that feedback mm. in a way? And so mm. you can, you know, um, then say attack, let's say the different points. Mm. This is a very, um, it's a very interesting topic that I'm dealing with lately quite a lot because I think I, I am the designer of this product and which means I'm very incredibly close to it. Like my, 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 my business partner, Kasper, who's kind of in charge of other things, he can actually sometimes take this feedback much better than me because mm -hmm. I'm just like, you know, I'm a perfectionist. I want it to be perfect at the start. And of course, this is an illusion. So I had to for myself really learn how to exactly how to receive that feedback and, you know, I, and, and speak to people um, that are not me, that have very different pain points. I think pain points when it comes to diapers and in general, like the usability is huge. So at the beginning, we were trialing and testing the diaper a lot more with people who are already cloth diaper parents, just to understand is our performance right and our fit. And once we had that checked, we started giving it to people who, you know, would swap a, a pampers for a sumo. And then we were like, oh my God, what are they going to think? And what are they going to do? And um, a little bit like you also just said, Pav, you know, there is no product for everyone. So, you know, now that like 300 people around the globe are using Sumo and we're getting, you know, it's mostly positive, but we're also getting a lot of, you know, this is not working. And, you know, 
And um, so, yes, for sure, I'm, 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 you know, I'm trying to pull it into, I'm, I'm trying to understand the pain points of people. Like, what, where are you currently? Do you have some experience with it? How, you know, it's such a personal thing to use that needs also so much explaining. Like, we designed this big uh, kind of instruction booklet and we already know that we're going to have to do all these videos. And it's really a product that needs so much explana explaining. Um, but I think only, you know, the only way is through. I think the only way we can design the best cloth diaper in the world is by going through that sometimes also very, very hard learning and feedback loops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's so, I think that's so interesting because I think that, you know, often, you know, if you're work, if you're an artist, maybe you're working and getting like feedback, you know, from, um, you know, the buyers um, and, and maybe that's it and from a couple of like close people, you know, that will give you that kind of honest feedback when you start to push it into from creativity into the entrepreneurial world. Like, I mean, you even, I've got a note, like you even said, you know, mentioned it's that everyday uh, products that are kind of elevated but also it's this creative idea that you've got that becomes this research project and business and so it's not just dealing with the material you're not dealing with the material perspective just from you know a designer you're thinking about it in so many different ways and you will be coming into contact with people who don't have an understanding of the materials in those ways or who haven't had the time or energy or or you know um possibility in their lives to even you know look into it any further than this is a product that i actually just need um uh, to use and so i think even those you know uh you know challenging kind of like questions and viewpoints that you're going to receive is something that um you know you you have to like build into um mm. you know, your your business and 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 all, i'm looking kind of almost forward to like sumo 2.0 like what happens next yeah. <laughs> and yes. the, the different designs i mean even the iterations of of you know the actual um the 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 shape of the designer you're talking about things and that m point you mentioned about it being rather than a kind of sanitary product being a piece of clothing is also kind of you know changes you know yeah. they're, they're they overlap and so i think that um i can see it keeping on you know well mm -hmm. carrying on um and you kind yeah. of just you know being um becoming obsessed with it and passionate about it which is great <laughs> yeah yeah That's great um, so we, um, I don't know if we've got um, just any more questions, just checking back um, on the um, chat. Um, so I think one of the other things that I, I kind of wanted to just to pick up on while we still have like maybe one minute left, we can go mm -hmm. tiny, tiny, tiny bit over. Um, uh, the, um, you know, really that um, kind of need to kind of specify the material and that also then links back to say your baskets you know um, mm. collaboration and we had that touching point in the in, with uh, Martina in the um, last speaker and also with um, also with Raf about this kind of community collaboration mm. and actually how um, it's more like a fam you are literally in a familial you know uh, uh, kind of uh, collaboration mm. and how that um, then has impacted you know the uh, the artisans that you're working with and maybe that you will work with what's the been kind of the feedback from um i've forgotten her name is it is it raya that her name is as well as my sister-in-law or uh, yeah the name of the product is raya raya i it's raya's yeah right is that the artisan's name as well no, no actually raya's is like it means stripes in oh, yes, spanish yes. Yeah. yeah the artisan is called vanessa yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this has been amazing because, you know, I, um, I, I, well, I started my career as a design student or working in design studios. You never actually meet the people who make it, you know, like if you design, work in a design studio, you're kind of more like a consultant to a big co other company that then has their production site somewhere else. So you, it's very uh, nuclear, you know, it's very much a, a, far away from from any reality or understanding and with sumo it started a little bit that i you know i would go to the factories and of course i would you know we are producing our diaper in serbia so of course i do lots of trips over there to to understand you know the people who are working who are on the yes. sewing machine you know what's the quality there how can we all of that so it already started but then going to el salvador not being able to speak the language of course i was with my uh, sister-in-law consuelo who kind of was in charge of all the spanish you know she's locally from there but this was really amazing for me to see that, you know, you 
everyone there is kind of a maker you know i think in, in europe it's kind of more like oh wow okay you have maybe like a carpenter here but you know you have so many highly people who who you know work in offices but over there it's most of the people are makers you know they're getting materials and their shop is their home so you know when we went um uh, scouting for uh, um, a family or like an artisan to help us make the baskets. We went to so many people's homes and they were so friendly. And you know, there, there's the television and there's their workshop and there's the kitchen. And it was just, and they were so it's friendly, that, you know, they, they let us to come into the home. So who we found now, Vanessa, she's doing it with her mother, um, her little brother who's in school, who's, who actually, you know, he, he's gonna, um, uh, he's also the only one in the family who speaks English. So this is really a new generation, but still he helps out, you know, he makes, 20 of our baskets he makes and i think this was so important for us to you know to meet them and to understand and to really work with them um mm -hmm. there's no other way around and that was beautiful i mean for me this is also now more and more these human connections it what what would make me get up in the morning i couldn't mm -hmm. actually go back to a design studio now and just be on a computer yeah you have to have that balance, I think. And that's one of the other things when you're this, you know, the creative entrepreneur, type, your combination of different things yeah. is to have that balance. You still need to have this creative output and, and also feel that, you know, um, who you're working with is, is, is actually giving you a drive and you're driven also to help and support other people yeah. and to yeah. kind of, uh, uh, you know, not exploit and have those discussions and really, yeah. um, you know, consider the context of who and where in where you're where you're yeah, working. Absolutely, um, it's really it's really really fascinating. I think we we're gonna probably uh, stop yes. <laughs> um, because we're a couple of minutes past. But um, I really thank you so much, and thank you to all our um, speakers and everyone who um, joined today. Um, we um, are going to be uh, obviously the session is recorded, so that's going to be on the Facebook and it's going to be on the British Council um, Spain YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see those back um, and continue asking questions about your um, you know, resourcefulness, about materials and see maybe hopefully that some of these um, parts of these presentations have inspired you to even look at what is in happening in your local area or in your country um, and to kind of you know think about those um, areas and um, that last comment um, about uh, really being um, you know people's houses being their their spaces we we have that probably more commonly since the pandemic um, even now but um, the Dyer's house from session one did mention you know they're called the Dyer's house because it was Casa, uh, the house of dyers, you know, or the blacksmith's house. And I think that um, kind of bringing it back to home and bringing it back to um, uh, our, our people, family, uh, community, if you want to use the word, um, it is, is kind of where we're going to be going with the next session. Um, and that's on the 21st of February, um, same time, same place. Um, so, um, yeah, just um, keep in touch and, and do, you know, um, yeah, uh, explore your materials further. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> thanks, Louisa. Thanks, Take Chris care. and Anna. Yes, thank you all to the, the British Council team. It's been great. Thank this you. is the, the back thanks end of Anna and Christiana. Okay. Bye. And Zoe, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>